participants at this program have prepared some cases uh, that they'll run by him uh, for his feedback and his uh, sort of input. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with the introduction. So I wanna give the uh, paper overview of Dr. Feldman. Uh, Dr. Feldman is uh, currently at the Paley Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, he went to Yeshiva University um, in New York. Um, he's in New York uh, from, he's from New Jersey actually, New Jersey, New York. Um, and he graduated from the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. Um, he did his internship and residency at NYU and what was then called the Hospital for Joint Diseases, but is now NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital. He did a fellowship in Peds Ortho at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and thereafter came back to NYU first as an attending, and then uh, very quickly after coming back, becoming chief of the division. He was uh, chief of the division for 14 years until 2015, uh, when he joined the Paley Institute as both the associate director and the head of the spine deformity and hip pain centers. So that's Dr. Feldman on paper, but Dr. Feldman is much more than what he is on paper. Um, he is uh, an, a very good teacher and I can attest to that because I was his fellow. Uh, and then not only was I his fellow for a year, but he encouraged me to do a second fellowship in hand and supported me. Um, and with his support, I did a second fellowship in hand surgery at NYU Langone um, in plastic surgery, and then came back and was an attending under him for um, a, a lost count, so seven to eight years until he left. Uh, when he left in 2015, it wasn't the same, and um, that's probably part of the reason why I'm here in New Jersey, uh, because I missed his style of teaching, and um, he really made the place uh, very dynamic at that time. Uh, Dr. Feldman is also a good friend. Uh, not only is he a good mentor, but he's a good friend. And on the bottom right here, you could see he has a longstanding relationship with the Israel Orthopedic Association uh, through Dr. Lehman, who's on this call as well. Dr. Lehman is a mentor for both of us. Um, and Danny Attar is the one in the middle. Danny was a fellow with them in the 80s and just kept staying on and on and on and really, uh, I think, became president of the IOA. Wally, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and really developed a very close relationship, right, between you guys and, and the IOA. Right. And then finally, because I have no pictures of Dr. Feldman's family, I just want to say I've met them all, and they're wonderful. And I thought it was hilarious when he, um, you know, he has three uh, biologic daughters, and then he married a woman with three biologic sons. And so it just was basically the Brady Bunch. Uh, and they're a beautiful family. I've met them all. He has now six grandchildren uh, and is certainly really blessed. They're all around here. He's a well-known entity in the New York, New Jersey area, had been for decades. And I think um, even though he's in Florida most of the time, he still travels all over the world and is uh, definitely, um, he still has close ties to this area. And then finally, as someone who spent a year or two in his office, I could tell you his other passion besides orthopedic surgery is contemporary art. David, this looks just like this huge picture of a crying baby in your office that I used to stare at all the time. They were basically like my patients, except these are Asian. I didn't know, you know, the minute, I, I don't know, the, the minute I started at NYU, this like Asian picture showed up. So I didn't know if it was like somehow my influence or whatever, but, uh, you know, you're really into contemporary art. I, God alone knows how much you know. I, I can't even, you had a Keith Herring in your office. So um, that's Dr. Feldman's other passion. If you guys, if anybody shares the same thing, he can definitely uh, talk to you about that at, in great detail. So I'm going to stop this brief introduction. Um, many of the people on this call also know Dr. Feldman. Um, you know, I think Dr. Liberace was your resident uh, at some point. Um, who else? You knew Dr. Weiser from, I guess, um, some, how do you know Dr. Weiser? Weissman. <laughs> Weissman, sorry. Yeah, David and I just said we're contemporaries, basically. And I, uh, even though we've known each other for a long, long time, you know, so uh, share drinks together at Posna, just a mutual the same fellowship about you two years apart so you know it's just that that small post in the community i think really yeah so it's an honor to welcome you as the first uh you know um combined um orthopedics uh grand round speaker at this point i'd like to pause and um you know 
ask if Dr. Benavinia would like to say a few words or if anyone else would like to say a few words before you talk. As we, uh, as you saw last night, you know, we really appreciate David uh, uh, giving this uh, morning uh, teaching session to us. So I just want to extend uh, thanks from, uh, from all the, all the, uh, all the people at New Jersey Medical School in Rutgers. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. Share my screen. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just want to thank, first of all, before I go on to my talk, I really want to thank everybody for inviting me, Dr. Benvenio. I was, I knew Dr. Barron pretty well beforehand. I believe he was part of this program as well in some way. And, uh, um, you know, it's a real honor to, to speak to uh, this many people and this many people that I know quite well. I didn't see Frank on here, but yeah, Frank was a, a resident when I was in attending back in uh, NYU and Alice was definitely a fellow with us and uh, nobody whines less than Alice True. I mean, Alice was uh, having her I think, second child when she was a fellow. I don't think she, I ever heard her say one word of complaint the entire time. There's Frank, hi Frank. Um, anyway, so uh, the entire time that she was there, she was really absolutely an incredible fellow. And uh, um, I was gonna show pictures, but she stole my pictures. So I'll show some, hopefully, you can see my screen. I'm going to put my talk up. And I really do want to ask you guys to ask questions. I sort of, I usually give talks I've already given before. I've never given this talk per se before. And I thought it was just an interesting topic to discuss with, I'm sure there's a lot of residents in your program now with these joining of programs. So I was going to give this talk on the commonality of treating uncommon conditions. And, you know, I think that, uh, again, Alice knows about that. We really did thrive on trying to treat unusual things. And both Dr. Grant, who's in the forefront there, and Dr. Lehman, who is my mentor and on the phone right now, really encouraged us to think out of the box and really encouraged us to think about just asking questions. It was almost like a Talmudic event going to uh, joint disease at that time. So really, you know, you could, you could always question and think if we're doing things correctly. And I think that has stayed with me. So Albert Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. So I think for the residents, whatever you learn today, you'll, you, you can use the basis of the anatomy and what we knew, you know, but will not be what you're doing 20 years from now. And so, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, commonality or common diseases, you know, there's about a million meniscal surgeries done per year. There's about 700,000 total knees, 400,000 total hips. And if you talk to Benavinio, there's only 900, you know, osteosarcomas per year in the USA. You know, so with have 50, you know, 50 states and divide that up among big medical sets, it's not that many. But then you treat some of the things that I treat, there's about 120 arthrogripotic patients born, 70 MHE patients, and only 12 patients with congenital pseudoarthrosis of, of the tibia born in the USA per year. So if you're gonna treat these rare things, you better find a way that you wanna to try to treat them effectively and, and lots of them because otherwise, you're not gonna be able to get a big enough uh, volume to really make a difference. So I'll give you some examples today of the three conditions that I treat that are uncommon. And I think that we'll try to go through what the commonality is in treating them. You're going to the background for this. AMC Oops, sorry, excuse me. Multiple mm -hmm. Okay, can Unknown. I'm not sure why, my, so I'm not sure why it's talking. So there's many synonyms to the word arthrogryposis. It's AMC, amyoplasia, arthromyodysplasia, multifocal, um, congenital articular rigidity. These are all words for um, AMC. But before we get to that, I do want to talk about this. You know, where does one begin in treating these uncommon conditions? So first of all, it must be an interest of yours. I mean, so for the residents, you can go and treat total hips and total knees and become quite good at it and make it your career and become effective in it, whether it's spine or, or you know, doing laminectomies and, and, and really um, innovate in that regard. Or you, but if you want to find uncommon conditions, then you have to have that as an interest. You have to find a work environment that encourages your creativity and the ability to specialize. Um, and then you have to look for trends within these cases that you're seeing. Uh, you really want to be honest with yourself about your results and about what you're seeing, which is true about everything in orthopedics, because we all say our patients are doing great. That's not always the case. And then you have to be, be creating. Being creative does not mean you have to be careless either. I don't think you just have to willy-nilly just think of things and just do them. I think that's probably a mistake that other people make as well. And then you've got to find old orthopedic procedures and maybe renew them. Maybe find things that have been done before to try to adapt them and relate them. And if you're going to treat uncommon conditions and try to find other people around the world 
or in the United States who do that with you so you can collaborate and see what their experience is and can they add something to that. I know Dr. Chu went out to Taiwan for a while to try to see what they were doing with brachial plexus, some other conditions. And that's really what you need to do when you treat uncommon conditions. You need almost to travel the world. And my senior partner, Dora Paley, has made a lifetime of that, a career of that, in trying to you know, adapt other people's work into his own. So again, this is uh, basically what arthrogryposis is. And for some reason, some of these have over-talked volume, but I won't look at those. Um, so that's basically what AMC is, right? It's a stiff jointed disease. And these are some of the associated syndromes with it. So sometimes it's not idiopathic. And the more we know about molecular genetics, the more we're finding that not so many of them are idiopathic. But what we can agree on is that arthrogryposis you know, means, arthro means joint, gryposis means stiff. And so it's a stiff jointed disease, right? It's, it's uncommonly known, most often unknown in terms of its uh, etiology, maybe a decreased blood flow to the fetus, or some kinds of neuronal insult. And obviously there may be some genetic forms of this and we're finding that more and more. And just because someone had a microarray, that doesn't mean they don't have a genetic form. I think you have to look at the molecular genetics these days and see. So a, micro, a patient telling you that a microarray does not mean they don't have a genetic form of, of, of um, arthrogryposis. And that's a conversation in its own right, the genetics of it. So we talk about arthrogryposis in terms of the hips being dislocated and stiff. Sometimes they're flexed, most times they're abducted. They could also be extended. Most often the flexion deformed the knee and sometimes an extension deformed the knee, such as in this bottom picture. You could have a club foot or a vertical tail. So all or none of the above can exist in this very, very unusual condition. So what does the ambulation require? This also, this is, you need to know this if you're gonna treat any patient who has some form of disability. So ambulation requires you probably have less than a 30 degree of hip flexion contracture, because above that your spine can't compensate. Requires less than 20 degrees of knee flexion contracture, so you don't you know, basically fatigue your quads and just fall down. Uh, it requires a relatively plantigrade foot so you can get it to the ground, and some truncal stability, some truncal control. You don't necessarily require quadriceps function as people who treated polio know. People with polio often lost their quadriceps and could still walk, mostly by hyperextending their knee or in my case is by, if you have a stiff knee, by using some kind of uh, you know, orthosis like a KAFO. You also need to have certain you know, range of motion to sit. So don't lose this. And I remember this in my first year of practice, a patient came in who had spine surgery and couldn't flex their hips before done by somewhere else. And basically couldn't sit in a chair after the surgery. So if you, have an, you need about 80 degrees of hip flexion to sit well, or at least 70, you need some degrees of knee flexion. And that's gonna become very important as we discuss what I've changed in terms of my treatment of AMC and how this evolved and how treating this uncommon condition, in my experience, changed over the last you know, 13 years of my practice and most importantly, over the last five years of my practice. So Dr. Bambasi and I published an article in 2007 saying the best way to treat a flexion deformity of the knee in arthrogryposis was to do an external fixator. And we said we lost some total arc of motion but we thought that they could walk afterwards, which made it worthwhile. Well, I would like to withdraw that article if I could. And that, that journal that Dr. Lehman and I discussed many times, a journal of retraction, would be a very large journal if we all got to retract everything we wrote in the literature. So when you read the literature, you have to be very careful. So I wrote that book and published that article, and I would like to withdraw it. So here's a young patient who changed everything that I do. This was in 2008. He came in from Italy, could not walk, had this knee flexion contracture. This was his ambulation when he came in. He could barely stand. He could not walk really unassisted at all. So I put a fixator on him. I did a beautiful job. Great, Elizabeth. I've got his knee straight and he couldn't bend his knee afterwards, but he could walk when he left. And this is his mother just sort of holding him. But he actually walks and he's still a Facebook friend of mine 12 years later and he's still walking. But on one knee, I just did releases. And on the other knee, you can see that right knee, I made stiff. But it's hard to live in 2020 with a stiff knee because basically we need to sit a lot. We need to sit for work, for with airplanes, for movie theaters, if we ever go back to movie theaters. Um, and basically in, in most in schools, and it's very difficult to live with a knee that's in full extension. In fact, most people I know who have knee fusions would rather have amputations and have a prosthesis and actually have a knee that's straight, especially if it's both knees. So um, I think that we need to be very careful when we give people straight knees. So I'm gonna show you this video just to basically show you that what, with, um, just show you what could be done. This is recently, there's a young man, young boy from Poland. Here he was in February. 
He has pretty good con trunk control, but his knees are bent about 90 degrees, hips are 50 degrees, and he could not walk. But he had really pretty good con trunk control. He can walk on his knees. It's not much of a life for a child. So when you live in Poland or even in London, they tell you buy a wheelchair and you should be happy that you have a nice wheelchair and you're okay. So this was in February of this year, pre-COVID. And then you can see he basically, there's a physical therapist who did this video for me. I didn't even know he just sent it to me. So I thought I'd share it with you. And here's his knees before he's got some flexion. He has no ability to flex his knees. So I'll talk about 1B in a second. He has no quadricep function. He has 60 degree hip flexion contractures and about 70 degree or 80 degree knee flexion contractures of his knees, right? So he's unable to walk. And he's about, I think, nine years old. And this is now five weeks post-op. And he has zero to about 90 degrees on one side and maybe zero to 75 on the other. So it not only increased his arc of motion, he made his arc of motion functional. He no longer has hip flexion contractures. So how do you get there? And that's what we're talking about and how we switch treatment based on results and based on, so that was him five weeks post-op with really a pretty good arc of motion for someone who has arthrogryposis. And he never had a fixator. So there he gets about 75 degrees and that's about 90 degrees and without pain. So here he is now five weeks post-op, his bone is healed and we'll talk about what we did. And he's trying to start, he's just walking for the first time in his life after nine years. And then this is him now about six weeks post-op, still being held on to. And now we have COVID as you can see. So he, they're wearing masks. but he's become an independent ambulator. And so how do you take a child who's never walked for nine years, and here he is 10 weeks post-op, and he's almost ready to go back to Poland. He's from Poland. And here's a, he's showing me how he's walking. And then he throws down his screen and he gave up his crutch. So that's how he went home. And we ring a bell when we're finished treatment, which is a really cool thing if you can do that in your care. When they're done care, they basically ring a bell. And so, that was his range of motion. He went from 90 to 110 before. Now he goes zero to 85, 55 to 100 before, now zero to 90. And both hips um, basically had uh, 10 to 60 degrees. So um, he really went from no, no hip flexion contracture. He's dancing around there showing you how much he can do. So how do you do that? How do you start with this knee flexion contracture and go to this is over 90 degrees and go to straight? There are the x-rays. So first you need to speak the same language. And that's what I was telling you before that basically um, you need to try to find a way to discuss so it. Should we classify in this... arthrogryposis or AMC? Uh, um, I'm having trouble with my computer here. So we took here. various, we took all of Can you hear that voice overrun? Can you hear that? Anyway, sorry. Um, so basically this is a, um, the treatment of, there's different types. And we classified basically AMC the different types. A type one was a flexion type, type two was extension type, A with quads, B without quads, and then you have hip flexion contractures, extension contractures. And this helps you treat the patients when you're gonna classify. That's what I mean. So you take a, a rare disease and you group them together. And here we have- So we took very- And there we have basically the different treatment of different types of um, AMC. Extensive posterior knee releases, multiple neurolysis, proximal femoral shortening, Judaic quadriceplasties, for type twos when you have extension contractures and type one and two is a stiff knee where basically you combine treatments for both. And there's different types of interventions and I'm not gonna go through these all, but I'm gonna show you what we did. So I wanna to get to other treatments as well. And basically this is uh, the different types of treatment, bracing, soft tissue releases. And what about hemiopiphysiodesis? So this is for the attendings out there. So hemiopiphysiodesis does not work in moderate deformities. It only works in very mild deformities. So if it's less than 25, and I think Harold's looked at this and saw the same thing, I've certainly seen this, and this ruins the knee for me. It basically extends the knee, and you cannot treat it after this. It's very difficult to treat it. So I really encourage people not to use anterior hemiopiphysiodesis for extensive knee contraction, because the knee will still be contracted. Osteotomies do not work. You have to be very comfortable working around nerves when you do cases like this. And I think that is true about almost all limb deformity. You have to be willing to really go around nerves. When I was a resident, I was told you can never go near the perineal nerve. I am decompressing the perineal nerve three times a week now. 
So I'm always around the sciatic and perineal nerve. I decompress it completely. An article written by uh, Monica Nogueira um, about 10 years ago in JBJS explains how to do that, and it's quite good. And I'll show you how to joint lice adhesions. What about this operation? What about the abduction deformity? Please don't do this operation. I know it's a published report or a technique in JBJS. Please don't do this. Don't bring the hips back by doing these really huge abduction, adduction osteotomies or varus osteotomies. You ruin the hips for me. You ruin the hips for the patients. It's not functional. And you don't need to do this. If you fix the hip flexion, the knee flexion deformities, the hips will come in and you can do an abductor slide, which I do in short in the iliac wing, and you don't have to do this osteotomy. I think it's really a mistake. What about distal extension osteotomies? Do not do this. It does not work. It gets worse again in about a degree per month, and they'll be back where they started from within a year, and you will be stuck with a very deformed femur. So what do I do? Why, why do I shorten the femur at the same time I do it? And we'll talk about that as I show you a case. Where do I do it and how much do I do? So when you shorten the femur in these patients to get their knees straight, you're globally reducing all soft tissue tension. You relieve the pressure on the nerves and the blood vessels, and you can rotate at the same time. So I work in probably the biggest center for limb lengthening, and I shorten bones much more than I lengthen them. And I do it proximally because that's never been described before. So there, so shortening the femur has been described before for arthrogryposis, always distally, but then you have no lever arm, and I can't straighten the knee. So basically, in the proximal femur, it's short. I have a very long lever arm. I don't affect the patellofemoral joint. And I can do seven centimeters of shortening and get the knee straight. And that's what I'm doing. So I, I use enough to achieve a straight knee. My number of centimeters does not matter. Yes, you could fall off Blick's curve, you can, but you can always lengthen later. And they, they do get their strength back anyway. And you really want to get it straight. Just to show you a case, is a young girl. There she is. So she's about, she's about 80 degree, but she has some quads. She is kicking her knees. And there she was right before surgery with us, trying to get around with her. And this is not functional. I mean, having knee flexion contractures and knee ankle foot orthoses that hold your knees at 45 degrees or 90 degrees is not functional. She's barely walking. And so this is, again, just showing how she was. That's her in the operating room. That's her in, that she had previous surgery. And basically, we shortened the femur, straightened the knee, and got her straight. And that's her. When I, did, when I used to do one side at a time, which I do now both at the same time, this is three weeks post-op. She has zero to 120 degrees, and she will maintain her motion. One side done. This is about five weeks post-op, showing her climbing stairs. So she's trying to get her strength back. And she's not even using braces here, because she has quads. So she's learning how to use her quads. And this is pre-op, you saw before, and this is six weeks post-op, and she's just starting to learn to walk. And here she is at a year post-op, walking on a treadmill. So it can really, with no braces, maybe just some SMOs. So it really can be done, and it is effective. And I think that, so what do we do? We basically treat the foot before. Now I have Matt Dobbs here, so he's going to start treating my feet. Uh, lateral incision, I release all the nerves, decompress all the nerves all the way into the anterior compartment. We do a medial incision for the soft tissue releases. I do a proximal femoral shortening. I do not temporarily fix across the knee because I get started moving within two weeks. There's no, absolutely no immobilization because I put a rod down the femur as well. Um, and you can talk about pterygium at a different time. I can show you that. Please don't do varus osteotomies. Just another case, just showing you that you can do this and it works. And just showing you how big an operation it is. You've got to be really willing to do everything. Here's the perineal nerve. There's the sciatic nerve. Here I'm trying to make a 1B into a 1A. I'm trying to make, he has no quad, so I'm trying to bring the biceps femoris around to attach it to the patellofemoral joint. Not sure that works. Here I am in the back of the knee, letting the nerve vascular bundle fall down. There's the back of the condyles, and I'm basically doing a full posterior release of the knee, leaving the arterial supply intact. And that's him in the operating room, basically with a full range of motion. And it really is an incredible change in what I can do based on not my own, just taking everybody else's procedures and putting them into one. Yes, it's a big incision, but it works. And that's him post-op, but I did one side. So I ask you not to do this because I have to revise that. And I hate revising these varus osteotomies. It makes it much more difficult for me to do the knees. And I showed you that. Just to show you one more child, I met her at an AMC conference. That's how she walked before. She couldn't walk. A year later at the AMC conference, 
There she is. She's adorable. And she's walking with just AFOs. And I thought she was, I didn't think she had quads, but she did in the operating room. So when they have quads, they can walk without it. And there's the same conference she's showing my wife how to stand up. I thought this was a great picture. She's teaching my wife how to stand up from a seated position. And this was a girl who could not walk at all a year before. So I think the purpose in showing you this case is that this is just taking other people's operations and making them into one and maybe adopting, adapting some things from other things. But utilizing shortening as a way to relieve soft tissue tension has really been described before, but never used in this way before. And just post-op, I get them moving right away. They go right into bracing. And just to show you, you can even work in pterygium. I'm not going to show you this whole case. So this is a case I did in Israel. It's a Bedouin child. I do Z-plasties, which I do. I even do, do this differently now than I did it then. That's actually the posterior tibial nerve coming down right under the skin. So if you don't shorten, how are you supposed to do this? You can't do a Z-plasty of the posterior tibial nerve. So you need to do something. And even after I did all these releases, right? This is, here's the pterygium, right? Here's the, the, the posterior. This is the, the tibial branch relieving itself of the perineal branch, right? So they actually disassociate in, in popliteal pterygium syndrome or in Escobar syndrome. And so I'm releasing the whole pterygium. I'm going back in the knee. I'm taking everything out. And even after doing that, that's as much as I can get the knee straight. So I shortened the femur, basically a ton. I mean, I had, I had a picture of the whole femur coming out of the bone through a separate incision. And there he is post-op after I did one stop, side. And I came back six months later to Israel to do the other side. And he had a good range of motion. This is just to say extension deformities. I still haven't solved this problem. I'm working on it. I could tell you, teach you a year later from now, I can tell you how to do these. But these are much more difficult because the condyles become flat and no condyles like to be moved after they're flat. So I asked Judith Hall, a great geneticist, when I should operate on these kids with flat condyles and extension deformities. She said as soon as they're born. I think she may be correct. But we do try to do these, put the hip back in the joint. I don't even cast these kids. I don't cast after I do open reductions. I put a zip tight in, which is like a little ligament and teres thing. And I don't put kids with arthrogryposis in body what cast. What we did was we took these. So, um, so the knee I don't know if you guys can hear my voices. Um, group in the, one second, maybe if I go backwards. And so the knee, and that's reviewed in these numbers. So, <laughs> I don't know how that's over, over voiced with me. Um, so basically, let me try to go back, sorry. So by stratifying the types that we have. So basically, sorry, I'm stuck here, guys. One second. This was just shows uh, the results of what we did in our first 50 cases. And basically just showing that we increased the range of motion from about 50 to 80 degrees. In type two, we weren't quite as successful in getting the, um, the knees to move very well. And in type threes, we were successful. So um, this type two means extension contractures. But we show that we increased the range of motion from about 50 degrees to 80 degrees in all of these cases. So I think that that really has never been described before in arthrogryposis and just shows- So by stratifying- um, So by stratifying treatment by classification, we could improve the range of motion. And by utilizing these studies that I showed you from, or these, these, kids, these ways of treating it from before and, and putting them all together, we could do that. And I think ambulation was achieved by all these patients. So we'll be presenting this and uh, dictate, and, uh, um, and we will be um, hopefully publishing that soon. What about upper extremity? See how much time I have left? Um, so basically upper extremity, I think we need to be constantly looking at function above cosmetics. And again, you know, we look at eating and self-care when we, when we deal with upper extremity and orthogryposis. But cosmetics do matter, and that's why I don't do, uh, I'll show you pec major transfers in women or even in men, because it really makes a huge incision on their chests. But you look at what, mus what, what muscles function and what you can use. Um, and here's another example of, of really understanding the conditions that are rare, right? Now, so in almost every condition that I know of, your wrist needs to be extended for your hand to function well, except in arthrogryposis. Many times in arthrogryposis, if the hand, if the wrist is flexed, you can um, have better hand function than if the wrist isn't extended. And it's the same reason, even, you know, that's one thing. And then the second thing, the position of flexion may actually be better for the patient. That's why most of our forks have a little bit roundness to them, because it's easier to get to your mouth if your wrist is flexed than if you have a straight wrist. So you need to be very careful before you straighten a wrist 
We all want to straighten things out because we're orthopedists, which means straightening kids. And basically, we don't necessarily should do that. So if you look back, so I started doing transfers, but I look back at the polio generation, even now the, the, the shoulder generation of people using latissimus dorsi. So here's a young woman we treated. And that had not been done in this country for years, so she couldn't get her hand to her mouth. This was before the surgery, but she has passive range of motion of her elbow, which obviously you need to get before. You also need to not have internal rotation. So she cannot get her hand to her mouth. She's 11 years old. She has some shoulder function, uh, but not much. That's how she writes. And this is not a small operation. So you take the entire latissimus dorsi off of its flap. I do it in basically take it off of the you know, with the nerve, basically uh, exposing uh, the thoracodorsal nerve and basically taking it off with the latissimus um, and, and, and as it exits from the brachial plexus. And then you rotate it and hinge it around that area and then bring it onto the arm and attach it to the radius. And this is at 12 weeks afterwards, and this is at two years afterwards. So she's still, and she's able to eat with that hand. I mean, she basically is getting stronger and stronger, but she is able to even eat an ice cream cone um, with that hand. Um, and so you're able to give her biceps function, which really, if you look at the literature, says you can't do that. But you can, and really you can read the, the, the polio literature and some really old paralytic literature that talks about that from years and years ago. I think it was a JBJS article like from the 1930s, which I found, which talked about it and try to read old Campbell's books on how to do that. And I've done it about 12 times now little kid from England who I did. This is right after surgery when he was still here. And he's able to, he's pushing his back up a little bit, but he's able to use his biceps. And his goal was to be able to, uh, you know, to use his hand. You can see how having a bent wrist may help him. So don't straighten wrists if you don't have to. Okay, so that's it for AMC. And I'm going to talk about, you know, one more condition or a couple more before I stop. But basically, the goal there was just to show you that you can change treatments even if you're a, an old man like me and change all what you do within 10 years. And by using some really principles of anatomy and principles of other people's work and combining them into one treatment. And I think that that to me, that's been the most rewarding thing I've done in the last five years because these kids, it's just the difference in them in their lives has been amazing. And, I, and the case shown last night by Alice, I think Alice's case of MHE, I wanted to show this in forearm because this breaks all rules. Like MHE, when you talk about form in MHE, this was the classification I think I asked one of the residents about, uh, or Jen about yesterday, which shows this. This is the most common classification used in MHE form, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. It is not a classification of severity. It's not a classification of how to treat it. It's just descriptive. So you have a type one where you have a distal osteochondroma. Type two, we have a dislocated radial head. Uh, type with a, with a distal and proximal radial osteochondroma. Type three, where you have two, 2B, where you have a just a distal osteochondroma, and a type three where you have a straight owner with just a distal one. So I mean, like, it, may, it just doesn't help me treat this patient and understand the disease. So when I started treating a lot of MHE when I got down here, because we have a whole MHE center and we we're involved in the study and you know using a drug which actually has been withdrawn since then. So we really had to figure out a way to treat this. And this is exactly the same case you showed me yesterday, Alice. And yes, you can treat this. The question is. Why wait until it gets to this point? You know, I mean, yes, I mean, I don't think I have to make a kid live with this for the rest of his life, and I can find a way to treat this by lengthening it out. So we looked at 73 forearms and tried to figure out what is it that makes this radial head dislocate? What is it we can do for these patients? So we had num big numbers of cases, obviously, and we looked at every single thing that we could look at, total ulnar bone length, radial bone length, radial articular angle, percentage of ulnar length, and radial length, and we analyzed it for all these different things to try to understand what created radial head dislocations. And we use logistic regression and found that basically, this is, the, this is the slide that matters, that total owner bowing and percent owner length matter. However, if you, if you have a straight ulna, even if it's short, it will not dislocate. So really all that matters is your total owner bowing. So if you can get your ulna straight like in a Montasia fracture, your ulna will not your radial head will not dislocate. Now, I may do a couple of cases which I don't have to do. Maybe there's some that don't have to dislocate, that, that won't dislocate even if they have a total owner bow, like this one of 30 degrees. It was a very long ulna that, that protected it. But basically, you know, you really have to start thinking about that all the ones that are not dislocated have no owner bow. 
and all the ones that dislocated have an ulnar bow of greater than 19 degrees. So I think if someone has an ulnar bow of, of, of 18 degrees, I'm going to straighten it, even if they may fall into that category of one that wouldn't dislocate later on. So we tried re redoing the classification, which we we're going to sort of fix up and present, but it made sense. You have a normal forearm, you have one with just osteochondromas, you have these type twos that can have basically a short ulna, a short ulna with a bent, with a bend, that's still just sublux but not dislocated, or just basically it's still you know, located radial capitellar joint, and one that dislocates, and one where you have a long ulna, right? How you shorten the ulna and do things. So I think all of them, you have modifications for whether or not that we talked about yesterday, the carpal slip, or if you have a radial tilt. But really what matters is you're preventing radial head dislocation. This helps in treatment of this condition. As you go further along, they become more severe, and you can know how to treat this. So this is what I was showing you yesterday, Al. This is what I was showing yesterday. Here's a child with, and if I did, I did an arthrogram in the operating room, I don't, I don't have it here. I should show it, where the radial head is starting to sublux. And you can see how the total owner bow here is probably about, this is closing in on 20 degrees. So all I do is minimally invasive, place a rod up to the level of deformity, made a small incision, broke the ulna, you know, maintained the rod, maintained this plate for rotation, and then basically got it to heal. And this radial head will never dislocate. Take out any osteochondromas that are blocking the interosseous membrane. This is the other way of treating it. You know, should you lengthen it? So this is beforehand. I don't think you have to do this. Just straighten it. It doesn't matter if the ulna is long or not. So here's, this is the description using this, you know, with a ra located radial head, but you don't have to do this because basically it doesn't matter how long the ulna is. And then this is another case, the same thing, but in this case, I did treat the radial carpal slip, right? I basically, um, I basically osteotomized the distal uh, radius so there wouldn't be radial carpal slip. And here I'm using, this is that case that, that, you know, that Alice showed yesterday, someone showed yesterday, you know, the same as the Japanese article, that basically, yes, if they're dislocated, you can do this. I just don't think you have to wait until this point. So I brought it down to length. I then did a bell talsy, and I did get it to look really good, and I got it to, and he's really happy, and he's got some motion, but I really prefer not to treat it after they dislocate. I prefer to treat it. And I use a circular fixator because I'm not that good with a, the monolateral fixator in a three-dimensional deformity of the ulna. So basically, here's a case where you, you can blow up the literature from the last 25 years and say that really what matters is ulna bowing and ulna length, and nothing else really matters. And that when you make it, when you make a classification, if you're going to, then please just include this. And if you see a bent ulna, you know, just like when you see a montasia fracture, just treat it. Many kids who have montasia fractures, you can bend that ulna back if it's acute, put a rod in it, and it will basically relocate their radial head, and they'll be fine if you do it acutely. So I think that this is another condition that's pretty rare, but if you have enough of them, you can find, again, just not really innovative treatments, just innovative, uh, basically, um, innovative uh, results or innovative, um, you're placing them in categories so you know how to treat them. And I'll do one more for about five, 10 minutes, and then I really want to open this up to questions and I'll answer anything. I'll show you one more condition. The rarest of the conditions that I treat, I told you 12 births per year, this is a condition that I treat so much of in here we treat it only for one reason, because everybody wants to amputate these kids. And even Dr. Lehman taught me that these kids are untreatable. And you know, basically that you basically you're just you're wasting your time that they're gonna break again. Just amputate them as soon as you see them. And I'll tell you, my biggest referral source, unfortunately, is, is the state of Texas, because they want to amputate all of these kids, and they don't have to be amputated. They are absolutely treatable. And this is one that you know we've adopted many different treatments in, in terms of combining everything together by understanding the pathology of the disease and by really including everybody's treatment over the last 20 years into one. So we all know that, when most of us know that CPT is called by, by a fibrous hamartoma, basically eating up the bone like little Pac-Man. Um, and so we look at medical treatments too, so you can turn off some of those osteoclasts by using uh, bisphosphonate, so we use zoledronate. Um, but it's mostly a periosteal disease. Um, so you really want to get, what is your goals of treatment of CPT? You want to get union. You don't want them to refracture. Um, and then you want to create some, you want to keep the ankle moving. So we never cross the ankle ever. I'll say never, even in a very distal one. So maintain the ankle motion. Don't create a secondary deformity and treat the primary ones. But then you look at the literature and Dr. Lehman was correct. The success of basically of 
its union without refracture is a success rate. So union rate times one minus refracture would be your success. And if you look at the meta-analysis done, there's a 50% refracture rate. Well, that's not a really good result if you look at the results. Whether, no matter what you take, basically, some of the literature says it's 50%, about 50% failure rate. So we did this. We said, okay, this is actually my partner really put this all together. He basically did zolendronic acid, resected the periosteum, and vaginate the bones. And everybody's done this before, right? Use a Fazier Duval nail, decancelize. That we've never done before. Taking a huge bone graft has not been done before. We take the entire, almost the entire ilium is decancelized, which is the hardest part of this operation. Um, I don't use a periosteal graft. You can. Um, and then basically we use BMP. Um, now I use a plate. I don't use a fixator anymore. And I do zolendronic acid again three months post-op. And basically we looked at these and we had no refractures. Doesn't mean we had no complications, we had no refractures. So some of them develop valgus, some have a wire pulling out, sometimes the Fazier Duval doesn't move. All these things can occur. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a technically difficult operation, but nobody refractured. And we got this, and this was really determined by Inho Choi. So if you give credit to someone in the literature, it is Inho Choi. He described doing this cross union technique. The thing is that he pushed the fibula to the tibia. So his, his cross, his area of, of healing was so small that they could refracture, uh, even though he had very few refractures. So what we did, what, what, uh, what Dror did was basically say, why don't we leave the fibula where it is and increase the cross area? Because we all know that R to the fourth is what you, as you increase the, the radius of your healing, it's much, much more. So we create a huge cross union. And I will tell you that I, since getting down here and doing this five years ago, I've had no refractures. And I will say that it is a revolution or an evolution that should never, this case should never be amputated. I say never. So you can resect the periosteum fully. You take a huge amount of bone from the, from the ilium, you decancelize the ilium, and we looked at this and we haven't had any problems with the acetabulum. You fill it, you backfill it with some calcium phosphate and calcium sulfate. You then, you take the periosteal graft, you can mesh it, use BMP, make a sandwich, and basically create a cross union. We remove the interosseous membrane, put a wire in the fibula, use a Fazier Duval for the tibia. And this picture on your left is my case. And that's how we do it now, basically not using a fixator. And that's the reunion you get. And it works. And it doesn't refracture. And then we change the rod out. But you may have to do something else. You may have to put an A plate in for valgus. But this is a case of mine. And basically, this was a complete fracture with complete, non with complete union. Um, and these kids are running around without bracing, even though I tell them to wear braces. So I'll show you one just because this is, the, this is a great example of why Dr. Lehman thought they all needed amputations. Here's a young girl from Arkansas, treated by really good people. You know, plating, bone grafting, rotting, refractured, re-bone grafted, refractured, got infected, re-bone grafted, refractured. 14 operations later, I saw her. She wants an amputation at this point. You can see it's not healed. Everything is loose. Um, and she's had an epiphysiodesis on the opposite side. And that, this is the point that I got her in September of 2016 um, with a refracture and really fed up. She's 11 years old. The ankle you can see is in calcaneus, which is pretty common. Um, and basically, I just, did, I just did the same exact thing I always can do. I did a hemiepiphysiodesis, where you'll see I lost the screw in, in a few minutes to get the ankle to go back into varus. I basically did a cross union technique and she fully healed and is walking with no brace at this point and a full leg with an ankle that works. And I took out that screw, but instead of taking it out, the bone was so osteopenic, I gave her a screw veneer right up her tibia. Um, but basically here she is healed by November of 2017, full healing of the bone, and we can change the Fazia Duval um, at some point. Um, just to show you, they even come from New Jersey. I didn't mind to rub it in, but they do. And basically the same thing, they don't have to fracture. This is. Going, this is, oh, this was my case actually that failed when I didn't know how to do it. So I put this in. I didn't have the, the cross, I didn't have that wire for the Fazia Duval nail, which you need to put in the epiphysis. And my case, the patient said to me, you know, sometimes I have external tibial torsion and sometimes I have internal tibial torsion. So I think that means they're not healed. And he was not healed whatsoever when they got down here. And when I got down here, I did a cross union. I used an X fix for this one because I wasn't using plates yet. And basically, I got him to heal just fine. So 
I didn't know how to do it before I got down here. I did learn how to do it, this cross union technique. It's a great technique. And it's one case of a rare condition that we basically think we've solved. And so none of these kids should be amputated. Um, all of them can be made normal now. And I think that it really is a revolution both in, in both the biology, of the, in, in treating the biology by medicines, by using you know, somebody else's literature like Inho Choi to describe cross union, by using some mathematics of increasing the surface area. And he, I just saw him recently, he's now four years post-op and he's doing fine. I don't have to show more cases. Actually, this now should, now what about a change? Here, I would actually fix this because of the deformity, but actually there's gonna be an article coming out in JBJS um, from Minneapolis describing using actually- um, the Fuck, dude. An ape plate for this. And basically the, um, in the treatment. And here you have you know, the treatment of it by the same way I did it before, and you get cross union and you get healing. So, you know, there are some unanswered questions in everything we do, which treatment should be left out? Should it be the BMP? Should it be a periosteum? Um, can we get a better rod to insert? This Fazia Duval is really, it's a, diff, it's a difficult operation, honestly. What is the ideal age? So the younger, the better, in my opinion, to avoid secondary ankle issues, but I don't like operating on any kid before the age of two in general. I just want them to be big enough. Um, and I think that that makes it um, uh, much easier to do. So those are three uncommon conditions that I have changed even later in my career in the last five years. So in treating uncommon conditions, we try to group them into categories like I showed you in MHE and in, and in the case of arthrogryposis. I think you should be skeptical, but still respectful of previous conclusions. And I think that that is the answer. So if you're not seeing the same conclusion, or if someone is publishing articles with different treatment protocols, when they published four years before with a different one, why, why did they change it? And that's certainly that's what Wally taught me. Why, why are they published? Why are they presenting a different treatment if the treatment worked so well in the literature four years before? Um, and, um, and you may have to alter treatment before you scientifically prove it. I think if you wait for scientific proof to change your treatment in rare conditions, you're gonna miss out. I think that, you know, I think what, I mean, they've taught us that certainly in the treatment of cancer and certainly in, and they're, they're really good at, at, at collaborating and creating treatment protocols and, you know, for rare conditions, Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma. And I think you have to remain curious and interested. And if you're not, then really maybe you, you should go on to something else. Curious and interesting, whatever you're doing, whether it's arthroscopy or ACLs or PCLs or, or, or rotator cuffs, you want to remain curious and sort of, not, you know, wondering if are we doing the right things and really being very critical of yourself. Um, I once left a, an operation and I said to the surgeon next to me, he was a plastic surgeon. I said, you know, maybe we could have done this better. And he says to me, you really think about the operation afterwards? He said, I just let it go. I'm like, yeah, I, I, go, I go to sleep at night. I'm thinking about what I could have done better and what I did wrong and what would make that a better result. So I think that remaining curious and interested, um, even way into your career, makes it interesting. It makes what we do such a, uh, a blessing in some ways that we can always be trying to help these these patients, adults, kids, and making it better for their lives. So um, it really is a calling for all of you. I'm sure if you're doing this, you're not doing it because you know um, you're you're not in it for the for the re remuneration anymore. You're in it because you really there's nothing else you could do. My daughter's in vet school, and so you know, I, I she said to me they asked her during the interview why she wanted to be a veterinarian. She said because there's nothing else that I could do. And that's the same answer should be for medicine. There's nothing else that you could do other than this. If there's anything else you can do, you may want to do something else because it's, it's, a, it's a tough life. But um, I leave it at that. And I really, again, really thank Alice and Dr. Benavino, Joe. I really appreciate you guys inviting me to do this. Uh, Frank, all of you guys. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person as opposed to uh, over Zoom. But uh, I'm certainly happy to take any questions about any of these conditions or anything else that you want to talk about. So I'll stop sharing now. Um, Dave, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And A, it's a pleasure to see you. And it's definitely a pleasure to hear you again. You know, there are few people in, in one's career that really leave an impact on them on how to think. And uh, you definitely were one of those people in my career. And even the few of our residents that from Jersey City came over and rotated when you were splitting time in New York and Florida even the short times they had around you, um, they remember that. So you're a very impactful person. And uh, it's, it's really refreshing to see 
I couldn't believe you could have changed to get better over the years from back in the late 90s, early 2000s. But it's great to see how you keep thinking and innovating. And it's really an inspiration. So thanks a lot, Dave. Thank you for making oh, the time. Right, uh, let's grab a beer sometime. <laughs> Sounds I'm good all there. for it. Next time you're up here, give me a call. We'll wear masks. So we'll sip a straw. We'll sip a beer through a straw with a mask. Sounds good. <laughs> thanks, Frank. Really nice words. Thank you. Hi, Dave. It's Flo Osula. Thank you so Hi, much Beth. for your talk. Um, I didn't get to know you as a resident. I actually got to know you when I applied for um, fellowship and I met you um, applying for fellowship. And we became colleagues and friends along the way. And obviously, I always share these rare cases that end up in my office because they have nowhere else to go. Um, and you always give me really, really great advice. So I just want to thank you for that. And particularly the last case that you showed about the cross union technique. You know, I've done it now um, twice and I've had really great success with it. And you kind of literally set, sent me that presentation and walked me through the steps. So I appreciate that. And um, I'll keep you posted on how those patients are doing. And you remember the cases. That's so interesting. You, oh, anytime I talk to you, you're like, oh, what's going on with that kid? <laughs> I'm sure you get so many people that ask you about these type of cases. So for you to remember that, it's like, I think makes you special. No, I love those. Thanks, Flo. I love those cases. I think that they're and you did a great job on those. And they were revisions, I think. Well, a couple of them were revisions. And it, I think that, you know, I, it's, that's an amazing change. I think while I can really attest to the fact that we did not know how to treat these in the 90s and the 2000s. And, and I think that we know how to treat it now, which is for me to see that in my career, a disease that I could not treat before or condition, now be able to treat it is incredibly rewarding and rare, actually. David, you're really teaching me something. <laughs> Thanks, <Paul. laughs> David, <clears throat> hi, it's John Capo. Um, mm -hmm. I remember seeing you at the uh, Joint Disease Faculty Meeting years ago, so good, good to see you again. And uh, I really want to thank you for inaugurating uh, and Alice for setting it up. The, you know, our, this is our first system-wide grand round, so I think it was a, a, a smashing success. And thank you. Uh, my question is, you know, I do upper extremity and the congenital radial head dislocations. So I tend to see them a little bit later. You know, the question, my question is, if they're asymptomatic, um, do we mess around with them? Or when do you think it's appropriate to deal with them early? And, you know, how important is it to get, to get that radial head in those cases? Yeah, so I don't, I mean, that's, you know, MHE is not that. MHE are not born with uh, congenital radial head dislocations. I think that, I think you're right. I don't, I don't put congenital radial head dislocations back in. I treat them only if they're symptomatic. And symptomatic can be cosmetic. I mean, it can be in some ways when they're older. And I usually wait till they're mature. Um, it depends how much motion they have. I mean, not every patient with congenital radial head dislocation has a lacking of motion. Some of them have pretty good supination and pronation. And so, you know, I don't mess with those at all, actually, until they really need it. And this, there has to be a really compelling reason. Sometimes if they're an anterior dislocation, when they get older, the radial head actually hits their humerus and they can't bend their elbow more than 90 degrees. So they have to be, they have to tell me why we have to treat those. But yeah, I'm not, I've not figured those out. I mean, I've, I've not figured out congenital radial stenostenostosis. I can't figure, I don't do anything for those. I don't do anything for congenital radial head dislocations. I do actually treat, I've seen a couple of congenital humeral radial stenostosis. And that I've resected and done well on. So if they have an old, if they have an elbow joint, but you know, those are, those are fixed, you know, extension contractures, extension, extension deformities. But no, I agree with you, uh, John. I, I appreciate it. I don't, I agree that they're asymptomatic. I wouldn't touch them at all. Oh, God, it's a guy's got to be something from a resident. He asked me something in this, uh, just a guy. <laughs> I was seeing, I was speaking blasphemy for most of those papers, most of those. <laughs> I, David, I have a, I have a question. I, I was uh, interested in your comment about um, maybe the, the, the child's perspective of a knee fusion versus, you know, a, um, you know, basically a functional above knee amputation with the, with the prosthesis. And, you know, from the, from, from the adult uh, limb preservation side, um, you know, we kind of lean towards, you know, uh, offering a, a fusion. Um, mainly because once adults hear amputation, they run for the door, um, but their energy expenditure, you know, is, 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 is really different. Uh, can you comment on that, on, on the perspective, you know, from, from the rare disease in the child? Um, what, what's, what's, what's your perspective on that? 
That's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, most of my kids are bilateral. Most of your patients are unilateral. And that's a big difference. I think living, you know, if you have a, a unilateral knee fusion, you can sit on that side of the plane. You can sit on that side of an aisle and you can somehow make adjustments. If you have bilateral knee extensions, you just can't sit anywhere. I mean, you just can't get into any, any place to sit. So that's number one. And I have a number of patients come to me just want amputation who have knee fusions. I mean, I, mean, I guess kids are different. You know, they are, they're not normal otherwise. And it's not like a tumor patient who had one side done and just wants to keep his foot and walk better. Because right, if you do an above knee amputation, that's a 60% increase in, in their energy expenditure. It's a lot. So, but most the kids that I see who have knee fusions really want their knees to bend and they're willing to even have an amputation to do that. And I, I try to convince them there's other things we can do. We've taken down fusions and done knee replacements with my partner. Um, that works. At times I've done some arthrogripotic knee replacements. I didn't want to show that because I don't have results enough to say whether or not that is enough to do that, but I have done some arthrogripotic knee replacements. Um, so, you know, I think that we've got to be creative and listen to the patients. I mean, they'll tell you, but yeah, I, got, I mean, if the patient, you know, is an older patient, I think I'd rather have an e-fusion than an amputation, but for a kid who's got bilateral, bilateral knee fusions, is, and, and if they're pretty tall, it's a nightmare. Sure. Yeah. Good, thank you. So David, I have a question about lengthening or about the ulnar correction in MEG. Um, you showed an acute correction of the bow as well, like as a gradual, like which one do you choose if ulnar length is not as big a deal? Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's not dislocated, I would never do an external fix it. I just showed you that for historical reasons only. There's no reason to lengthen an ulnar. I mean, I think this whole thought process that you needed to buttress the carpus is absurd. It's almost like, you know, to some extent, it's like the sports guy is doing a trochleoplasty for the patella. You don't, you don't make bumpers in, in, or in, in, in biology. It's just, if you actually, the ones you do it on, they have pain later on. They get pain in the distal radial ulna joint and they get pain where the ulna impinges on the carpus. So if you just, every case where I have a subluxation, not, we're not talking about dislocations now because I, you do have to lengthen. But if it's, just, if it's just sublux, which a lot of these cases are, and you can tell by tenderness, they're all tender over the radio capitella joint as they start dislocating and they lose some motion. I just do those all acutely. And it's such a simple, I mean, literally it's a 20 minute operation. It takes, it's, it's, it's a nothing surgery, honestly. It's just, you basically make a small incision like you would put a rod in the, in the ulna. You, you I'd put a, a wire and a drill then down to the site of the deformity because you can't pass it beyond the deformity. Then that tells me where exactly the apex of the deformity is. I make a small incision in the subcutaneous border of the ulna. I cut it and then I put the wire down, drill, put the rod in. And many times I put a little 2-0 plate with only two screws or no plate if they're very young. And then I put them in some type of removable splint, which I don't remove usually for about four or six weeks until it's healed a little. And then that's it, it's over and they're, they're done. Sometimes as they get older, you may have to do it again. You may have to actually, because they can grow crooked again, but uh, that's rare. I've had to do only that once so far, but you know, give me time, probably have to do more. So the length thing I reserve for anybody who has a dislocated radial head, that's the ones I like. <clears throat> Any other questions? Hey Dave, this is Flo again. Um, have you ever seen for arthrogryposis um, an asymmetric deformity? I mean, asymmetric contracture, like I have a patient that had a flexion contracture of the knee on one side and an extension contracture on the other side. And what did you do for that, for a patient like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, yes, the, the most asymmetric condition is Larson syndrome. By far and away, the most asymmetric. I mean, their knees are never the same. Their hips are never the same. They are the most complicated of all of these because you really have to look so carefully, understand each deformity separately. But yeah, I mean, so I didn't discuss much of extension because I didn't have time to discuss everything about extension contractures. But those are flexions you just treat the same way. I would just do the way I showed you in this, in this, during this talk. I mean, just, I mean, just, it's a huge incision. You can watch one. I think I've made a video of it, but I could, if you ever come down, I could show it. That's really not, it's not that difficult an operation. It's just a big operation. It's just a big scar and, and you've got to be willing to make a, be right around the perineal nerve and decompress it. But for the extension ones are really problematic because even if you get them moving in the operating room, they don't move afterwards. They get stiff again. And so I get them moving zero to 90 in the OR and then I just lose all that motion, maybe get 20 degrees. Why am I doing the surgery? And then serendipitously, I saw a patient from somewhere else who they detached the quadriceps by accident. They, made, they did a, a quadricep, basically ruptured the quadriceps when they did it. And that kid kept his motion. 
So now I'm wondering if we should be detaching the quadriceps, getting the motion, then going back in like later and reattaching the quadricep mechanism. Um, I, I'm always wondering how I can do this better. I don't, I don't think I have an answer for extensions yet. Um, if they're very young, I would do them very young. And I've been successful a number of times with extensions, but they're more difficult. And I do do day quadricep classes. I don't do VYs usually. I take down the whole joint. I release the whole quad. I get the whole joint moving. But I will tell you, I never cast them. Don't cast them in flexion because then you'll get a flexion contracture. I just get them moving right away in therapy. And one, the one problem with this, all this treatment arthrogryposis is they really need to go to therapy a lot right afterwards. So for instance, surgeons in England can't use this because they can't get therapy for their patients post-op. And so it's almost untreatable in the, in the country, and believe it or not, in the UK. Um, because if you don't do therapy afterwards, they will fail. Um, it's just not going to work. So I think that it's really, it's really a crazy situation. But yeah, but you treat each individual joint this separately. I've seen unilateral. I've seen only one upper extremity. You can see it, it can be very asymmetric flow. It doesn't have to be symmetric. You see quads on one side, no quads on the other side. David, can I ask you, it, maybe it's out of your forte, but anything new with symbrachydactyly in the yeah. hands? We used to do non-vascularized toe transfers, but, you know, they didn't, if you didn't get to them by a year or 18 months, they really didn't last. Any, any of your colleagues or yourself, anything new? I mean, I don't, have, I don't do any of that. I mean, my colleagues, I mean, so one of my colleagues does that, does the, uh, the, toe, the non-vascularized toe, toe to hand before 18 months. They do that. I've never seen the results on those, so I'm always wondering how they do. Even those, I've never seen them. And then Alice can talk. I think Alice worked with David Chu. I think Alice can mention he talked, who did vascularized ones. And I, I don't know much about breaking med at all. I don't think I, I stop at the, I stop at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. I won't go to that joint. So, but maybe Alice can mention what David Chu would do for those, and maybe what she could do for those. I can't treat those. Alice, what do you think? You, you see, you ever see? Yeah, the yeah, I agree that for. Um, for the toe transfers, David Chu, uh, no relation to me, uh, tended to use them mostly for amniotic band because symbrachydactyly, the vasculature was like abnormal and small. Um, and, you know, if you're doing it below age two, anastomosing like a one to two millimeter arterial, um, you know, juncture is pretty hard. So uh, he's mostly published on toe transfer for amniotic band, but nothing that I know of for symbrachydactyly. Mostly his treatment was just, you know, getting an opposable thumb and a grip um, by rearranging the fingers rather than toe transfer. Yeah, I think if <clears throat> if he, uh, you go non-vascularized, you got to get him really young. We used to do him under a year. And if you keep the periosteum and the physis, they get some growth, but not, um, you know, not really rewarding results. So, okay. Yeah, I'd love to see one results on those. My partner does them. I always say to him, I want to see one that looks great. I've never, I've seen him do the surgery. We did it in Europe a couple of times and I've seen the surgery. It's not my, I, I really don't do finger surgery at all. I, I try to really stay out of all those hand guys. You guys are, it's a different specialty and I really have enough stuff that I do without <laughs> dipping into yeah. the hand surgery realm. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so if there are no other questions, it's 8.33. Um, and, um, you know, David, we're going to mail you your certificate and honorarium. So, you know, if everyone else has uh, things to do, I just wanted to say this will probably conclude the official Grand Rounds lecture uh, because we want to, you know, spend the next hour discussing cases. Should we go right into it? Yeah, sure. You know, I don't, I don't get a beer out of this. I mean, usually, you know, you drink the night before. We don't we don't get any of that. I'm still talking about that. You know, I don't know. I'm stuck on that process. You don't get that. <laughs> Drinking beer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you go on. Well, and I have a house really close to each other in the Berkshires. We used to see each other before COVID, but uh, where I am now. My favorite place in the world. We were there last weekend. We got lost in the woods. I told you that with my wife. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh my God, the colors were just unbelievable. But uh, it's really one of the most. If you, for all you guys in Jersey, if you've ever been up to the Berkshires, it probably is one of the most beautiful places in the world. It really is. I'm proud of you, David. You did a good talk. Very Thank good. You, Thank you. I, I owe you a lot. You're a good friend. Sending my paper and amputation to the Journal of uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you you put my name on that CPT paper for amputation. That's right. I can, one one more one more one more article for the Journal of Retraction, right, Wally? But <laughs> what question I I could ask you though is what do you do with the pseudoarthrosis? that's so distal that it's hanging on the physis 
at the ankle. What do you do so for that? I have three of those, and I do the same exact thing. I've got one from Colorado. You know, it was a really great story because he had a distal fascia. I'll send you if you want just to look at it. Um, he was he went to Denver Children's the same time somebody else went to Denver Children's um, with CPT. He came down. I fixed it just the same way. I just you know you get your base of the fice is going to be gone. You're going to lose the physis for sure. Um, but you do exactly the same thing. You just put a ton of bone in, um, you know, down there, and you put the same wire. You don't cross the ankle joint. Um, but you go right down to the, into the syndosmosis, basically. You just put it all in there. So he came in the same day. One kid had an amputation, the kid, and he had obviously limb salvage. They were back three months later. He was walking, and the kid with the amputation still hadn't had a good prosthesis. He had some skin breakdown. And so there's no question this, is, this alters it. But you can do it no matter how distal they are. You can do the same operation. And I, that's been the amazing thing. This, I have a kid, really, literally, it was in the epiphysis. And I still did the same thing. And I... Uh, and I got it to heal. I just got rid of the valgus, and I, I did have to get rid of the valgus, but I treated it the same way. But I mean, the Fazia Duval is still a fiddle. It's still a fiddle factor. I mean, that is a tough rod to use well, and, that, and putting a 1.5 wire into a 3.2 nail crossing that really can, can make you insane, just so you know. <laughs> putting a cross wire of a 1.5 wire into 3.2 nails is, is, is trying. Right. Okay, that's what we're talking about right now. Nine-year-old with, with CPT. Let's take a look. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think this is a good trade. So we gave you a segue, Dylan. You got a segue right into it, Dylan. Go yeah, ahead. perfect. <laughs> so this is a nine-year-old female with a past medical history of NF type one who presented who had uh, congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia and fibula. Um, she presented uh, here at age five from Ecuador. Um, in Ecuador, they were trying to treat the deformity. Uh, she underwent multiple surgeries, um, and. Uh, was unsuccessful and went on to non-union and eventually was treated with serial casting. And the discussion was beginning to be made about um, possibly amputating. And that's when the child's mother decided to come to the United States to get a second opinion. We can go on to the next slide. So just a focused physical exam. She was non-tender to the palpation of a tibia. She did have a broken bottom deformity of the left tibia. And interesting, she had the multiple cafe lay spots right around the area of the pseudothrosis. Um, she did have the skin um, over the anterior lateral area of the tibia was very thin. Um, she also had a clinical leg length discrepancy of about three centimeters, with the left being shorter than the right. Um, and then just of note, she also had multiple cafe lay spots uh, present over her right legs, um, chest, and back. So we can go to the next slide. So on initial presentation, this is at five years old when she first showed up to our office. Um, it shows the uh, pseudoarthrosis of the tibia and the fibula um, in a distal one third. Um, and it shows that it's, it's now a non-union and it's refractured through that area. So, I mean, the, the, so some of the things I look at in this, in this slide is obviously you're looking at the pseudoarthrosis, but that, yeah. in my opinion, is treatable, right? So, I mean, you're going to resect that dead bone, you're going to treat it, but the, the things I look for is, you know, I look for the station of the fibula, right? Where is the physis? So, usually the physis of the distal fibula should be at the joint level, right? If not, you're going to end up in, Alice and I wrote a paper on this, lengthening the fibula, which, again, enters the Journal of Retraction, um, and we published that paper, I think, finally, but basically one more article, and I, don't, I wouldn't do that now, I'd probably shorten the tibia, but in this case, it looks pretty good. Now, one thing you'll see is it right. She's an affected calcaneus, right? The you could see that the ankle stuck in calcaneus, and that actually is pretty common after long treatment of these kids. I mean, she had a, a rod across the ankle at some point. You can see the scarring in the talus, and so she has an ankle that may be stuck somewhat. And you may have to include that in your surgery of releasing the anterior ankle capsule and trying to get plantar flexion of the ankle because you know that stuck in calcaneus is not an easy problem to treat. And that's the biggest problem I see in this case is the ankle itself. You can see the changes in the Taylor dome. Um, so I think the things that people don't think about is what I'm thinking about in this case. Otherwise, I think exactly what I showed you is what I would do. Yeah. You gotta resect all that dead bone, culture it, make sure it's not an infection. And if you shorten it enough, the skin can be, you know, that this, I, I think then the skin that's thin will probably be okay. When you make your incisions, always make, never make them over the tibia, make them over the anterior compartment and cheat a little bit so you don't, and I don't like closing anterior incisions with monocryl. I like closing them with nylon. 
Hey, Dave, just... do you, can I ask a question, Dave? Do you think the calcaneus is a part of the disease process or do you think it's from the nailing across the, the, um, the calcaneus? I think it's from, I think it's a, it is, no, I don't think it's only, it is, I mean, nailing, nailing across the, off, across the joint just makes the ankle stiff and ruins the joint. I, I mean, I've done, I've revised a bunch of those and I just can't, I never would do that anymore. And I did it during my residency. I did it during as an attending using Williams rods. I think it's actually compensation. It's compensatory, right? I mean, you have a procrevatum deformity. So in order to get your foot on the floor, you have to go into calcaneus, right? So just like, you, just like Dylan was saying, if you have procrevatum, and the only way you're going to get this foot down, otherwise you'd be on your toes, is to get into calcaneus deformity. And over time, that's why you want to treat it younger because they get this sort of a secondary compensatory deformity of a calcaneus deformity. So I think it is not just from the rod, it's from compensation of the, of the joint from having, having a procrevatum deformity. So unfortunately, just due to some uh, other consequences, it took about a year for her to finally get to a point where uh, we were able to operate. So these are just quick pre-op images at what it looks like um, right before the operation. If you wait long enough, it'll heal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can just get through these. So then here are some uh, just interop fluoros. Uh, it shows that we went in, um, resected all the pseudoarthrosis, all the dead bone, and then did end up passing a flexible nail through the talus and calcaneus up through the tibia. We can go to the next one. We can get to the next slide. Dr. Chu, can we get to the next slide? I think she's trying. Okay. So then we uh, uh, placed a spatial frame or circular frame. Yeah, this is an Elizaroff, it's not a spatial frame. Yes. Um, then we can continue. Right. So I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think Flo knows how they feel about this treatment and whether or not it got it to heal or not. I just, I don't think this is the right treatment. But I, I understand that this is, if you look at the literature and historically, it's what people did. So. Oh, uh, one thing I did forget to mention: there was also a cross fusion done, and uh, the, the, after the pseudoarthrosis was. Um, removed, it was packed with the oleocrast bone graft and BMP. Yeah, so I think you can start looking. I mean, the one big thing different is the is how much bone graft you can get. And I've even taken both crests, but we, we literally that I was I think is the hardest operation. You need to get like Pega makes these very sharp osteotomes. You need to split the the two tables before you take an ounce of bone. So I literally make an incision, a very long, you know, very very long ilioligmal incision, I go all the way to the back. You're taking posterior crest as well. I basically use an, a, a pega osteo, and I go all the way from the anterior inferior spine. I put it down all the way to the posterior column, and then I open up the tables. I actually split up, up to the age of about four. She's too old for that, but I basically split the tables. I actually open the tables without cracking, trying not to crack the outer or inner columns, and then I basically decancelize the entire ilium. And so far, we haven't seen any complications from that, except that you have to transfuse your patients. But they really lose a lot of blood from that many times. And if they're very young, you may have to transfuse them, which is unfortunate. Okay, so what happened to this kid? This is, this is two years ago. Yeah, so we can uh, just kind of advance pretty quickly through the next one. It just goes through some of the pre-op, I mean, the post-op images. So we can just keep going. Shows that he starts to form some union. And then um, here's about uh, five months post-op, which mm -hmm. would, she was transferred into a long leg cast. Right. We can just continue. Looks good. Still looks great. Yeah, so then she she ended up, she did go on to Union. Um, can keep so going. What do you do about the ankle? Do you take out the rod? So if we go just a couple more slides. One more. So this is where we are at this point. The rod is still in that uh, goes from the calcaneus to the talus. Um, she now has about a 4.5 centimeter limb length discrepancy. Um, so she's still walking around in a cam, uh, clamshell AFO. She's doing well, able to walk and not having any problems. But the next um, uh, procedure that we're planning on doing is to trying to uh, give her some of the length back and, and make a small uh, limb length discrepancy for her. And uh, the question that we were kind of pondering over is, do we take the rod out at the time um, of the lengthening or do we leave it in and try to lengthen um, with that flexible 
uh, nail in place to try to prevent from uh, refracture. Yes, I mean, if you're asking me what I would do, I think I would lengthen this. I mean, it's hard, it'd be hard to get the wires. You can use wires only in CPT. You don't usually use half pins for your fixator. So you're going to lengthen this proximally. So you put the wires really proximally, you lengthen it, and you're holding the ankle in position for now, which is nice so that you don't have to worry about contracture as you lengthen. And then when I got the length out, I would take the, the fixator off, take that rod out, and put a rod into the tibia from you know, anti-grade as opposed to retrograde. That's what I would do. So I'd leave this in, lengthen her. When you get length out, when you get the whole length and you're finished healing, I would take the fixator off, take the rod out, and put a rod anti-grade so you have ankle motion and so that you have, but I would never leave this tibia unprotected ever. I would always have a rod in this bone. So you could just use a slim rod at this point. She's old enough. If you don't want to use a Fazio Duval, otherwise you can use a Fazio, you can use some like Fazio Duval nail. Um, but because uh, she is still growing, she's only like nine years old. Or she, she's, she's nine years 12, old. Right? Yeah. So at some point you can just put like a slim rod in or something like that or something. I like slim rods, but you can use some kind of rod like that to hold this. It's not going to be big enough for a, um, she's not big enough to use a uh, precise or a, or a um, you know, some type of uh, internal lengthening device. Could you use the new precise plates? You can measure this. I'm not sure I want to use that in this case, but I think I just put a, simply put a fixator, wired fixator on her, lengthen her. When I take it off, I put on a, uh, um, I put a rod on the bone. Just go really slow when you lengthen her because you have to make sure the regenerates good. And I give her as a ledger eight before I lengthen her. Um, any tips or tricks for removing this uh, flexible nail down the road? <laughs> you'll get it, you'll get it. I mean, you'll get it out. I mean, I think the easy, the truth is the easiest way to flow is to make your hole for your integrate nail and just push it out the bottom. You know what I mean? So make your hole for the integrate nail through the epiphysis. Come, you know, you're, you're going to put a rod in, you're going to put, say, a slim rod, get a drill bit or some or cannulated drill bit onto the tip of that, of that flexible nail and just bang it out the bottom of the foot. And that way, because trying mm -hmm. to grab it from the calcaneus is a pain in the neck, but if you bang it out, it'll be fine. You're gonna put a, you're gonna put a nail in anyway. You're gonna put a, a new nail, a new rod in anyway. So that's what I would do. That'd be my trick. I just worry about refracture here because of how thin your your bone is. But she's doing well. So it's great. See, you see, fifty percent. That's fifty. That's that's your fifty percent. <laughs> So I, I guess the literature is about to change about this, but I, I found this review article that just talks about um, the treatment of these cases. So uh, what they found is that operative treatments have pretty high rates of complications and um, between eight and 33% of these patients will go into either non-union or refracture. And that's when the discussion of amputation uh, kind of comes into play. Um, and then a leg length discrepancy was found to occur in about 79% of these patients, so a, a very high percentage. Um, we've actually then, published, we've published our results. Our results are published now. I think Drawer published them. They're published. Okay. So all these changes. So we actually, the 100% unit paper was published by a uh, drawer in this woman. I forgot her name, the doctor from Munich. But uh, it's published. I think I'm on that paper. I think I'm on. Um, and then what they found in this is just if you, if, for surgical treatment, if you use the IM rod and an external fixator, you can get pretty high union rates, uh, about 83%, and then a uh, relatively low refracture rate of about 16%. Yeah, I agree on this issue. That's exactly how you should treat this. Yeah. <clears throat> and then just one other article that I, was, that I found um, about lengthening kids that have um, these kind of deformities. So, uh, the, if you do proximal tibial lengthening by uh, distraction osteogenesis, what they found here is that you can, they obtained an average overall, overall length gain of about 3.5 centimeters um, with a healing indice of about 89 uh, days per centimeter. And what they, the conclusion they came to is that um, you can use uh, distraction at osteogenesis uh, um, in the proximal the metaphysis and it's safe and effective to gain um, length in uh, these patients. Well, I agree, it's gotta stay really proximal and you can see that 89 days per centimeter is high. Yeah. Very, that's a very, usually it's 60, so it's a really high, so you gotta go really slowly and let him heal before. That's why I think you should use selegionate because 90 days per centimeter is a lot. That's 200, I mean, if you're getting three, seven, four centimeters, that's a year, so that's a lot.
Thank you. No So our second patient is a 12-year-old male with a history of bilateral club feet since birth. He also had a left-hand amniotic band syndrome affecting his small and ring finger. He's been previously seen at an outside hospital. He underwent serial casting. He had bilateral posterior medial releases, as well as about four surgeries on each foot. Currently, he wears AFOs and sneakers around the house. He walks and runs primarily on the lateral side of his feet with pain, um, but also crawls quite often. Per his mom, she denies any family history and there has been no genetic testing. Alice, we were published, did you ever publish that on the amniotic band? Did you ever publish that article? Is that ever? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Um. <laughs> Long story, I have, I have two laptops I'm dealing with here. Um, yeah, the amniotic band and the toe transfer, that was published in uh, PRS online. Yeah, cool. Okay, sorry. Ben, you're on again. Yes, do you mind going to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, for physical exam, his gait was noted to be into a gait on the right lower extremity. There was an extensile lesion from proximal medial foot to the mid medial lower leg. He had ridges equino cavus on that on the right side as well as the left. On the right, he had an FPA of 90 degrees as held in supination with the forefoot adducted. On the left, his FPA was noted to be 45 degrees. He underwent a preoperative angio bilaterally, and films are on the next slide. What's his ankle, John? What's his ankle range of motion? It was ankle? significantly rigid. You could only get it to about like five to ten degrees of uh, dorsiflexion. Um, so, his arc, so his arc of motion was very small. Yes. And he's how old? He's at twelve. Yeah, he's twelve. Okay. He's twelve. Okay. So looking first at the left foot. And you can see a dysmorphic calcaneus. His talocalcaneal angle was measured to be about 12 degrees. And did he have a talectomy or this is all just untreated? As far as we know, um, we didn't have a great history from mom, but he just had those posterior medial releases. Okay. He had surgeries on each side, so multiple releases and X fixes were applied in the past. I mean, I know what I would do for this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I know the right thing. Don't show his post op. So, okay, go on. Let's, yeah, we can see it's a really great foot. Okay. Yes, yeah, so similar to the left, there's also a dysmorphic calcaneus. The talocalcaneal angle on this side was measured to be about 14 degrees. So, I think as you think about this, the way I would think about this is I would think about the ankle as different than the foot. I would think about those as two separate entities, right? I think about the fact that he's an Aquinas separate from his foot adductus slash cavus slash, you know, deformity that he has, right? Because I'm not, I, I, you can't treat them in the same manner. And I think that, you know, my con the concept of shortening to me still exists even in this case. That there's two ways to treat it. Like, you have a stiff foot. You're not making this foot unstiff. I do not know how to make an ankle that's stiff unstiff. I've not figured out a way to do that in orthoriposis. Certainly, I don't think you're going to do that in this case. Why well, I asked what his arc of motion is. He has no motion. This kid is a stiff, rigid foot. You're not going to make it move, no matter what you do. You're not putting a total ankle arthroplasty in there. So the truth is, you just, you just need to get this foot plantigrade. So how are you going to get a foot plantigrade? So I think about the ankle and the foot in two separate entities, and I don't think about them together. So I would consider, you know, I don't care which one you treat first. You know, you serial cast them first to see if you can stretch out the adductus of the foot to get them. And I think even that that does have some play and some role in this in doing Ponsetti, even a 12 year old, even someone with amniotic band, even someone operated on before, you may stretch out some of the soft tissues, which will help you with the surgery. So then you talk about what, what are the options, right? You think about options in this. Well, one option is external fixator. You could put a, a circular frame and treat the whole thing in that way. And then I guess you combine, still you have to separate out the foot from the you know, you do as a miter frame, you have to separate the foot out from the ankle into two different two different areas of correction. You got to correct the, the, you've got to correct the, you know, the pronation of the, the supination of the foot. You've got to correct the adductus. You've got to create, a, fix all of that and the ankle position. I don't like using fixators for feet. I just, I just think that patients 
have a huge amount of pain when you use them. And I personally, but I'm not against them. I just don't particularly like it. So I just think about shortening everything. I would do an ankle fusion, shorten my take out his physis, just take out the whole thing, get his, I would, and then I would do foot osteotomies to get his foot back into normal. And I would almost do no soft tissue in this case. So I think that basically I would just try to do everything in, in shortening this foot and shortening the, uh, um, the ankle so I could actually get this in position. I mean, the soft tissues are gonna be released in the process of doing this. Um, but that's, that's my answer for this now when, when I deal with all these really crazy arthrogripotic feet. And I just did, I, could, I just did one just like this and I can show you the result. And it's a stiff foot, but it's plantigrade. And that's all I'm trying to achieve is a plantigrade foot. So I actually take out the whole distal epiphysis of the, of, the, uh, of the tibia and just shorten it enough. And I take out the whole distal fibula as well. I just excise the distal fibula. And I basically put the Accutrack screws up from the heel after I get the heel in position. And then I do not, I stage it. And then I basically get the ankle in position and leave the foot sort of adducted in bad position. And then I come back later in about three weeks and then do something to the foot. And the reason I don't do it at the same time is because I worry about losing the foot vascularly. I worry about the fact that I'm really causing a big hit to this foot. So I release the tarsal tunnel. When I do the first operation, the whole tarsal tunnel gets decompressed um, all the way down into the foot, including the medial lateral plantar nerves, come up proximally with it too, so that they're protected throughout this procedure. I make a lateral incision, I take out the fibula, and then I actually use a transverse incision to take out the distal tibia. But it's I mean, it's meatball surgery. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a great looking operation. I'm willing to listen to other ways. But the only other way I see to do this is with a fixator, and that's just a bit of torture. And they recur after fixators sometimes as well, and that's the problem. They, they actually get, they come back, and the deformity comes back. You're just stretching out soft tissues. It doesn't like it. So there's no right answer for this, but that's my answer for it. So what'd you do? Dr. Le wait, wait, Dr. Lehman. What do you think? Still here. I'm still here. <laughs> I think shortening is a, is a good idea. I think I would uh, address, address that first. And then with the foot, as you heard me say many times before, I would probably decancellate everything. Heel, um, 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 talus, cuboid, everything, and make it into sort of a hamburger and just put it in a plantigrade posi position and just hold it that way. And it should you work out. Totally well. agree, Wally. You still, still totally agree. agree. That's really good. After all these years, we still agree. Make it the hamburger surgery. That's what it is. But but also, but also the, the skin is gonna be a problem. And unless you do the shortening first, you can have real problem with the skin. And you may want to address the skin first and have a plastic surgeon or someone come in and just take that whole scar out, put a um, um, a flap over it and get good skin and then do your surgery because the skin's going to be a problem. Sorry, I'll, I'll move ahead and show you what, what happened. Jen, Jen, you back? Yep, I'm here. Uh, so we decided to first treat the left foot. Um, he was indicated for a left cuboid opening wedge osteotomy a medial cuneiform closing wedge osteotomy. Additionally, he underwent a lateral calcaneal slide and application of a Taylor spatial frame. He underwent two months of adjustments under the Taylor spatial frame. Dr. Chu, if you'll go to the next slide. Agony. These are the immediate postoperative films. Nice. And then, as I mentioned, two months postoperatively, the spatial frame was removed. And this is his most recent follow-up at four months. Yeah, so you're right. He didn't have a brace for like three or four weeks and it started to go into varus again. So, um, you know, he, yeah. he's gonna get got his AFO, you know, the heel went into a little bit varus. So either I have to be on top of him with casting him until it sort of socks in there. You know, Michael Hausman used to say it takes three months for the soft tissues to like settle down in their new position. So 
Um, I mean, you know, it was just a little bit of Varus, but you can see this already. This is like after three weeks in a cam boot. So yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think you did great. I think it's a great operation. But you know, I, I, um, you know, I think either in there's many ways to skin this cat. I just think that you know, shorting the soft tissues prefer. I think just doing the ankle first could have helped you. But he, he's look, he's doing great. I mean, if you can get him to stay that way or get him a little bit better, it's great. It's, I mean, he's a lot better than he was, but. Right now he's only four months post up. He just looks very tentative. I, I just don't like the fixator in general for the foot anymore. But you would use it mostly to hold the foot as opposed to correct the foot. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. He only had the CT angio showed only one vessel, the DP. So like you know, it, it was very tenuous. After the osteotomies, he stayed pale for like you know two minutes. Uh, I had yeah, a pen rose. I really were. That's why I decompress them all. But I mean, you're right. That that CT angio would scare the heck out of me. But that's why I decompress them all. I, I go in there and all of them, but I, but he's already had some big surgeries. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, this is complicated stuff. You bag that artery and you have a loss. I mean, I've seen feet be lost from this. I've not lost one yet, but I've seen lots of vascular injury. That's why I divide it up. That's why I'm really, I don't do text, you know, I don't release the toe flexors at the time. The toes will get white. I mean, you really, you can lose the feet in these cases. And I think that you've got to be exceptionally careful of the arterial supply and the venous supply of the foot, um, it's really quite significant. And you know, that's why I really shorten quite a bit, which obviously loosens everything up. But if he only has, a, if he only has an anterior tip, I'd hate to go anteriorly <laughs> and do something. If that's his only artery, honestly, that would be very scary. Yeah, but that's why I had the frame because I definitely didn't want to cast him post-op or have any extra instrumentation because uh, of the vasculature. We'll see how he does, let us know, it's an interesting case. <clears throat> So you're gonna do it the same way on the other foot. That's the question, Alice. Are you gonna do it the same way on the other foot? So no, so this parent, this family uh, is very obviously uh, not into doctors. So to, to maintain the trust, I did the easier foot first. On the right foot, which is harder, I'm gonna do a gradual correction. I, I'm def and have a plastic surgeon with me to release all the scar tissue beforehand. But this foot, I felt like I could get away with uh, just bony stuff. So in, in honor of Dr. Lehman joining us this morning, I included one of his articles uh, in which they retrospectively reviewed patients between 1979 and 1987. 24 patients, 29 feet were included, 20 of which these patients had posterior medial release previously and recurrence of the club foot. Most commonly, uh, the revision surgery which they used was a complete soft tissue release combined with plantar release and capsulotomies. They utilized a functional rating system to evaluate their patients as shown on the right side. It included 10 categories with a score out of 100. So go to the next slide. Patients uh, had a score of 85 to 100, esteemed excellent for eight patients. Um, 11 had good outcomes, eight with fair and two with failures. In reviewing the patient's factors that were most likely to lead to a recurrence included an incomplete initial release of soft tissues, the presence of a talocalcaneal bar, as well as a Z lengthening of the flexor tendons and tibialis posterior. That was a good paper. <laughs> that was a good paper. I thought so. <laughs> you don't want to retract it, right, Wally? It still stands. No, that still stands. Okay. <laughs> but I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our next patient is a three-year-old female. Back on. Pardon? Nothing. You're back up. All right. A three-year-old female presenting with mom to the emergency department. She complained of right knee, left knee, buttocks, bilateral hands, and left shoulder pain. An unknown mechanism was stated. Per the mother, she had received her daughter from the patient's godfather that morning, noticed that her daughter was refusing to walk and complaining of pain with sitting. Uh, the patient had lived with her godfather for the past six months due to mom having unstable living conditions. She was born via repeat C-section full term. She had three sisters, uh, no contributory past medical or family history. Next slide. 
So just a focused physical exam. She was afebrile, vital signs were stable. Uh, she was diffusely tender over the right upper extremity, but she was moving grossly. Over the left up, upper extremity, she was also grossly tender to palpation. She was noted that her shoulder and elbow range of motion were decreased compared to her contralateral side. In terms of the right lower extremity, there was gross edema about the knee. A flexion deformity was noted. Uh, she also had a foot drop and she was unable to dorsiflex to the ankle or the great toe. She had limited knee and ankle range of motion as well as diffusely tender. The left lower extremity was grossly normal. So what's your thought process, Jim, before you even go forward? What would be your thought process? What would you think? So given the history of you know, six months living with a relative, you know, no known trauma, you immediately are going to be concerned about non-accidental trauma, um, abuse in a patient like this. Right, I mean, you're, you're, that's what you're set up for. I'm not sure it's, it's what it is, but you're certainly setting us up to think that, right? You're telling her she was in unstable, unstable living condition. She was fine before and now is diffusely tender and swollen. So unless she has some weird form of, uh, you know, Lyme disease or you know, meningitis or some kind of septic arthritis, she's basically going to have you know, abuse until proven otherwise, right? Yeah. I don't know why she has, I don't know she has a drop foot, but it's an interesting one. But okay. Yep. So a skeletal survey was ordered. Um, looking first at the skull, we see a normal cephalic atraumatic skull. Going to the next slide. Looking at the left shoulder. Uh, there's a left proximal humerus fracture with posterior lateral displacement of the humeral shaft. You can also how see long, extensive... How long, ago that, how long ago did that happen, you think? It, it, probably several months before our presentation due to the presence of the callus formation and periosteal reaction. But probably four to not, six weeks. Probably not, not months, but probably four okay. to six Months would be already even better than this, right? This is more like six weeks, maybe. I don't know. Something like that. You can still see it. She's not completely healed. You see all that fluffiness still. So I don't think it's months, but certainly it didn't happen yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Looking next at bilateral forearms and hands, you can see a subluxation of the right first uh, metacarpal on the right hand. There's also a chronic deformity of the left distal radius metaphysis, as well as the coronoid process of the left ulna. For the right femur, you can see a distal femur complete physeal disruption with the epiphyseal displacement anteriorly. Uh, there's a metaphyseal sclerosis and pseudoarticulation with the proximal tibia. Um, and again, you can see some periostitis as well as callus formation along the femoral uh, diaphysis. How long ago did that happen? Pardon? How long ago did that happen about, you think? I would say similar to the shoulder, uh, a couple of weeks. Maybe, maybe a little bit shorter than the shoulder, maybe three, four weeks. Maybe. Four weeks. Wow. Okay. Nice case. <laughs> it's really very good, Jen. It's depressing. Yeah. yeah. And then the next slide. Yep. Looking at the left lower extremity, there was a Salter II fracture of the uh, tibia with about four millimeters of anterior and lateral displacement. You know what fractures like pathognomonic for abuse? So in reviewing of the literature, you know, spiral fractures and any tib-fib fracture is uh, high alert for abuse. We're talking about corner fractures being those pathognomonic ones, these corner fractures around the, you know, these the, like this tibia is like that, right around that area of the medial metaphysis and these corner fractures of the growth plate are supposed to be path. I mean, this is already old, but again, that same four week mark, whatever, but it's pathognomonic for, for abuse. What's going on with the knee here? Is that knee also? Is that just, it's bizarre, right? Was that valgus deforming? It's strange. So there, there was question about the stability um, and intraarticular uh, involvement of the fracture. Um, so in discussion of what we did, I'll touch on that. You shoot the mother? That should be the first and the godfather? Uh, so first we conducted an arthrogram with manipulation of the left knee. Um, we were able to see that there's no interarticular component of the fracture and the knee was determined to be stable through manipulation. 
Uh, we originally tried to close reduce the right thumb, although due to the chronicity of the injury, uh, we ended up conducting an open reduction and removing the callus. Unfortunately, we don't have fluoros, but there were K wires placed in a retrograde fashion. So that is the corner fracture, by the way, if you see the orthogram. So if you mm -hmm. see that and you don't see the periosteal reaction, that equals, you know, abuse until proven otherwise. I think it has to do with a twisting injury to the physis, but basically it's called a corner fracture. They get a corner broken off the metaphysis. And if you see that supposedly, that equals child abuse until proven otherwise, supposedly. Would you expect there to be a ligamentous injury? I mean, you didn't uh, see what, would you expect there to be one? Potentially. Um, I mean, it was stable through range of motion, so we did not believe that there was any ligaments. Right. So probably not. In a young child, the, bone, the, the physis is much weaker than the ligaments, so almost it would be really rare. To see. That's why I was so surprised to see any kind of ligamentous injury. They just usually break right through their growth plates, and that's what you've done. You've just broken them right through their growth plates. You know how much this contributes? So is that just proximal tibia growth, but you know how much that contributes to growth if it closes? She's three years old, right? Uh, six millimeters per year. Right, so she's six millimeters per year and she's got about 11 years of growth, so yeah, seven centimeters of growth. That's, that's a lot of growth. That's a lot of, that's a lot of loss of height if it, if it closes. Okay. Yeah, so based off that, the thumb was purely dislocated and actually the worst injury I thought, you know, like you were saying, ligamentous injuries are so odd. So if someone actually took the trouble to not just break her through her proximal phalanx on her thumb, which is the easiest way, they actually took the trouble to like dislocate the thumb MP joint, you know, it, it was just that, that was the most like, I don't know why, of all the injuries. M the MP, M MP joint? I don't see yeah. it dislocated here. Is that dislocated? No, it's reduced now, but it was actually dorsally dislocated. Like they took the trouble to dorsally dislocate her thumb. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine what this kid is seeing. I just, it's just beyond yeah, it right. was just bizarre to me that they would it just was obviously it takes like a localized force looking now at the right lower extremity uh, she was indicated for osteoclastus of the right distal femur as well as an application of a spatial frame initially two k wires were placed parallel to the epiphysis these were tensioned allowing to it to be brought down from its extended position we then placed half pins of our spatial frame uh, directing this, our this, is the foot, this is the foot with the drop foot? Yes. Um, so in our dissection down to release uh, the distal femur to allow for reduction, uh, it was noted that the popliteal nerve vascular bundle was compressed. Um, so that was released in the process. And then here you can see the Taylor spatial frame in place. Uh, and the patient underwent about two months of serial lengthenings before removal of her spatial frame. So what chance, so how much does this physis grow per year? Uh, nine millimeters per year, the distal femur. Right, so, it's, so she's gonna lose about 10 centimeters of height, right? Yeah. This is, huge, this is a huge amount of growth, okay. Here's our three month follow-ups. We have five month follow-ups as well on the next slides. Um, that's the only question. I mean, you had to release the artery for sure in the nerve. If you left the growth plate all the way up there, Alex, you think it maybe it would have like kept on growing? <laughs> you think maybe it could have remodeled? Who knows, right? And now it's fused. I mean, the growth plate fused. Yeah, I, I uh, now I'm dealing with a knee flex. The knee was contracted. Like I, I had to deal with the bone first, and I tried to reduce the knee joint as much as I could. That's why I spanned it. Um, but now the knee range of motion is literally like 60 to 80. So yeah, I think now I would honestly, I would actually, I'd probably go in there and do and, and fix everything anatomically and, re and, and release everything. It's, it's, is that fight? Is that, is it, is it dead? No, it's alive. I think the arterial supply is fine. There's no emergency, but I think that I would, you know, go in and just do everything. You're not going to do, I don't think physical therapy is going to straighten this knee out, but it could. I mean, everything's healed now, so you've got it healed, but it's not going to remodel you that spike posteriorly, which is like, is the rotation normal or is it rotationally off? No, rotationally, she's fine. Well, yeah, I mean, I yeah. think I would, you know, still, it's still extended a bit, the distal femur. So you really have a 90 degree flexion contraction because you have 30 degrees of extension of the distal femur. So the contraction is 90 degrees. The, the, because the, because the, distal femur is extended 30 degrees. So the reason it looks like 60 is because you have 
not much. So that's you know how I mean obviously they're not in an emergency to do anything if she's vascularly and neurologically getting better. And, but you're gonna have to buy you're gonna bite the bullet at some point and just put everything back together again like Humpty Dumpty and then release the posterior capsule and get her moving like an orthodontic. But I mean maybe you can loosen her up with therapy. I don't know. It's really quite an injury. So it's a 90 degree contraction because if you if you measure off of as opposed to measuring off the, the, the distal femur, I mean, excuse me, excuse me, instead of measuring off the metaphysis, measure off the distal femoral condyles, you'll see it's 90 degree contraction. Yeah. 90 degree yeah. Right, she's riding right on her um, posterior condyle. Right. So, exactly. you, so you, to get the motion back, you would do it like the arthrogrypotic, right? The type one or the type two? Um, yeah, I mean, whatever, no, I mean type, you know, it's a type one, I mean, just a flexion deformity. You don't have to give me a call, you don't have to call the types that I call it, but basically it's, it's a flexion deformity and you have quadriceps. So I think it's so, and again, I mean, I'm, she's in a, excuse me, she's in a really an acute phase of healing still. So I, I almost want to say that you want to get her into like a normal phase of psychological and physical healing and then see what you have and then take, and then just go slowly and yeah, take it down and make sure the arterial supply to her distal femur is not, doesn't have AVN there. doesn't look like she does. Um, and then, um, yeah, I would just go through and just make a big lateral incision all the way down, you know, do a re-release all the neurovascular bundle. I may, I, would, I may osteotomize your distal femur to put it back where it belongs. And then I would, I would do releases and I mean, she's, she's genetically meant to be straight. So I think this is not as hard as it looks. What happened to her proximal fibula? Where is that? I don't see it. Is it gone? It's just bony. I don't even see the proximal fibula. It's almost like it's like sitting out somewhere posteriorly. It's, just, it's going to be a horrible. It's going to be a horrible dissection. That's the bottom line because you have scarring and yeah. everything is not, everything is not where it belongs. So just find some normal tissue and go from there. I'd find the almost the nerve as it enters into the anterior compartment, release the anterior compartment, release the lateral to muscular septum, and then work my way up and just find everything as I go along. It's going to take a long time to do this dissection. Yeah. No. I'm pretty sure. That the Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was a, I, I just stunning child abuse case, like just the worst ever. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I don't take your call anymore. <laughs> I just, I think emotionally I couldn't deal with this. Is like, you know, how you, don't, how you don't kill the mother or godfather, whoever did this to her, whatever. It's just unfathomable. It really is. <laughs> well, that was a happy case, Jen. Thanks. <laughs> really happy case. <laughs> So just looking at her most recent mechanical axis, as we mentioned, you know, there's consideration for the physial growth loss, um, and there's future concern for a limb length discrepancy. Um, so just, sure. If you have any suggestions on how to approach those going forward. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'd, you know, I've, in these cases, I restore the mechanical axis. I make it completely normal. Unfortunately, you can't do hemiopiphyseal you know, stapling because there's no growth plate. So I would get a mechanical axis perfect. I would get her knee. I mean, remember, right now you can't tell her limb length discrepancy because she's got a knee flexion contracture of 90 degrees. So that's going to contribute to her six centimeter discrepancy. So once you get her out to length and you get her moving, get her motion, forget everything else, I would use you know, intramedullary lengthening later on. I'd use a precise or whatever later, later on, a few years from now, get five centimeters at a time, be gradual, you know, do something really simple. And then you can use either a grow plate for the tibia or, you know, again, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, Area. So if it's long enough, I don't know how, it's got to be like 160, 160 millimeters to use intramedullary, but her, her, her canals are wide enough. So I would basically just, you know, I'd wait till she's much older to do that, give her a shoe lift in the meantime, but get her straight, get her moving. And then once you have her moving and good and maybe in a new life situation, when she's older, when she's about 10 years, 12 years old, I'd, I'd lengthen her bone and maybe do it more than once. So you leave the right, you do the precise, you go about five centimeters, you leave it in. Mm -hmm. And then maybe three years later, take it out and put a new one in and do another five if she needs it. Um, and then you can consider doing an epiphysiotesis on the left side if, you know, you, she's going to be tall enough and you don't want to do one more lengthening or you think you've, you've got to get predictions of how much. But, but based on what you showed me, she's going to have a, you know, a knot, a, a 10 centimeter from the femur and a seven you know, 17 centimeter limb length discrepancy. That's quite a bit to make up. So yeah. um, you're going to be... This is a light, this is going to be a childhood, but you can make her normal. The goal now is to get her straight, get her moving, make her into a normal patient with short legs, and then you can deal with that down the road as, as she gets older. Okay. 
we already touched upon that, yeah. This is just mentioning, um, you know, child abuse, non-accidental trauma is the second most common cause of morbidity and mortality in the pediatric population. Um, and looking at the most common locations of fractures, the tib-fib being the most common, uh, followed by the patella, and then actually the carpus. Interesting case. I think we have time for one more before uh, okay. finish up. So, what's case seven? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a, a patient SI. It's a 15-year-old male who um, immigrated from Bangladesh. One-year part um, uh, evaluation. Now, John, did you pick a did you pick a short straw or something from all the residents? How did you get to present so many cases? <laughs> you and Jen is like, okay, go ahead. 15-year-old. Hey, what's that? They pick the short straw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah, he, he had a known scoliosis from the, uh, age, uh, the, uh, from the age of um, eight. And um, he uh, presented to the, um, the clinic. Now uh, he uh, um, does a back pain uh, with activity and with laying down. And also he, does, he did have um, a weakness, bilateral um, lower, lower extremities and some radicular symptoms. Um, he did not have any cardiac, pulmonary, kidney, um, GI, blood or bowel. Um, symptoms. What's your indication to obtain MRI? Before you even show the x-rays, what's your indication to obtain an MRI in scoliosis? Why would you get an MRI in general? Um, MRI um, and patients with, before we obtain, I mean, um, I think we should get the x-ray first and if it shows any, if it's, if it's painting congenital picture, then we should move forward with MRI. Um, yeah, but how about it just an idiopathic? Let's just say, before you even show me this kid's, this kid's x-rays, what in this case Makes you want to get an MRI before you know right away. What, oh, are, what is the, it? Uh, the, the, the abnormal neuro, neuro, neurological exam findings. So that's easy. That's an easy one, right? So he's abnormal neurologically. So that that gets you one. What else would get you one, even if he didn't have abnormal neurology? When, um, did, he get it? when did he get his scoliosis? How old was he? Um, it was first noted at the age of eight. Is that normal to note scoliosis at the age of eight? Um, it is not. It's, it's, it's a little too um, early. Too young, right? So it's juvenile scoliosis. So everybody with juvenile scoliosis gets an MRI too, right? Because 20% yeah. incidence of neuroaccess problems. So he's young. Mm -hmm. He's a male with a severe scoliosis probably. If you're showing me this, that, that gets him an MRI. And now he has neurologic symptoms. What about his pain? Does back pain warrant getting an MRI? Um, back pain you see with idiopathic scoliosis as well. So it's like less um, important. So what, what in the pain would make you say, I'm, so what would be unique about the pain in general that would make you get an MRI for pain? Uh, pain with activity. No, I think pain that's constant, right? If it's constant pain, the kid's complaining of constant pain, waking him from sleep at night. If it's just occasional, then I think it's probably normal for it, like you said. Okay, cool. Let's see the x-ray. Um, oh, so for the examination, um, uh, like he had um, significant left thoracolumbar prominence so with board bend and the... Um, um, and also, um, neuro exam wise, right side, right lower extremity, um, L2 to S1 was uh, 4 out of 5. And on the left side, um, L4 to S1 was 4 out of 5. Um, otherwise, he did not have any long trip signs and reflexes were all symmetric bilaterally. Which reflex is the most important to measure for scoliosis? Which one do you think for looking at abnormality or the reflexes? You know? um, the abdominal reflexes. So the, Asymmetric abdominal reflexes would be very good. Um, yeah, yeah, th th those were symmetric. I would say that would be the one you want to look for. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah this is AP and lateral um, of the patient. That presentation uh, shows a very sharp uh, um, um, scoliosis at the lumbar region, um, at apex at L3, L1 to L5 measuring 72 degrees on the AP. And what's, in, what's interesting is um, he um, T5 to T12 is kyphotic, five degrees is high kyphotic and you see the lumbar kyphosis there of 14 degrees. Um, what well. else do you see? What do you see at L34? What do you see at 34? Um, there's a re retrolisthesis of L3 on 4. What do you see on the on the AP? Oh, and the uh, L3 is a hemivertebrae that you can see. Right. So it's a hemivertebrae. So he's very weak on the, on the left side, which is unusual for this because you think you'd be weaker on the, on the right side where you think the side that has no pedicle, maybe he's missing a nerve root, right? You could be missing the nerve root there. You could be missing the L3 or L4 nerve root because um, three and four, really two any vertebrae. It's like that there's an L3. He's got more vertebrae than he needs. I don't know exactly what's going on. Five, four, three, two. Yeah. 
that more vertebrae than I think he needs, but okay, cool. So this is a 72 degree congenital scoliosis in a 15 year old. Right. All right, so you're gonna get, you're gonna show me an MRI? Oh, yeah. Um, next, next slide, please. Oh, this is bending film, uh, which shows a pretty stiff curve at the uh, level of um, stiff curve with right and left bending. Now, next slide, please. And, um, so first we have cats going to L spine. Um, the, I think the first one is sagittal and the second one is coronal. Coronal is, coronal is more interesting to see. It, it clearly demonstrates the hemibrotebrae. It's fused to the uh, the cranial. Um, it's fused to the L2, and then you see the disc space between L3 and L4. How many rads do you think this this is? So he's got two there. Go back if side. Go back. How many rads do you think is this MRI, this CAT scan is, this patient? Uh, not small. Yeah, so you probably should know because you're exposing these kids to a lot of radiation. All right. Okay. By four, three or four rads. It's five rads for HFCT. So we should probably be more, we should probably be really careful. So that's a pretty cool MRI, right? That's, that's five, four. So L3, right, has the hemi vertebrae, two, one. And then four is sort of like wedged into, it's just so weird. Two sort of wedged into four. Yeah. Around, I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've seen that twice, but it's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. And, um. Yeah. This same right at the L spine. Um. First, we have coronal and sagittal. Um. E even in coronal, you can see the, uh, the. That's why I don't know why you need a CAT scan. The MRI is so much better, and it shows you everything you need to know. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. there's your hemivertebrae. It's going to come out, and you're gonna, that's going to be the answer, right? But you know, you're not going to you're not going to be able to work around this. I don't think it's 72 degrees. Yeah, I'm sure what you're seeing. The next slide um, shows the MRI of L spine um, in the axial plane. You can clearly see that the uh, uh, spinal cord is being um, uh, pulled to one side. I mean, at, the, um, at that level, it would be caught the Ouch. Yep. Is he tethered? I couldn't tell what level you're on. Is he tethered? Uh, he, he was not tethered. Mm -hmm. Okay. What level should the spinal cord end at? What um, level should your conus be at? L1, 2. Okay. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. L1, the, 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 the disc space at L1, 2 is where it should not go below. It shouldn't go to L2. Yeah. I think we miss a lot of tether cords. Anyway, go back again. Let's just see how, how compressed he is. I don't know what level I, I always look at the sagittal and the tray and the coron at the axial at the same time so I know what level I'm up on. Those are ribs. So there's the cone is coming down, so I was wondering. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, it's really squashed. I don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah, um, so this is the intraoperative picture. Uh, so the operation, um, so we first went through the lateral approach um, to excise the L3 hemivertebra. And then in the next picture, please. And that's the, uh, the image looking down at the L3 vertebra that's being ex that to be excised. And next picture. Yep. And this is some property floor shots for uh, localization. Um, Next slide, please. And this is the one with the um, osteotome into the uh, vertebra. And so uh, the operation was staged, and a couple of days after the initial um, L3 corpectomy, um, we did T10 to L5 fusion. Yeah, I mean, I think I would have done this all from the back, but I think there's many ways to skin this cat. I think I would have taken yeah. this all out from the back. Um, and not gone from the side, it's too hard to go from the side like that. So I think I probably would have gone all from the side and just done a VCR of L3 um, and not done it from the front in this case, unless I wanted to put a cage in or something like that. But even then, I think it's just as safe to go, you're decompressing them anyway. You're gonna decompress them posteriorily, you're gonna come all the way around, stabilize them with a rod on, the, on that uh, the other side, which is the right side, and then take out the whole L3 on your vertebrae. Did he do okay neurologically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, this is my case. Um, he, he did really well neuro neurologically, and you can put up the post film. So I, 
I, you know, I was trained in fellowship to sort of do what you just said. And I have an adult spine partner here who does a lot of lateral uh, sort of approach. And he, I showed him this patient and he said, you know, we could, you know, he's so skinny, we could probably just take out the hemivertebra through a, through a, you know, with lateral retractors. So we split the psoas and the, the uh, hemivertebra was right there. So, you know, it was, we probably could have done it all in one day too, but we were unsure of so, how, how this would go. And so we- Yeah, I saw you use the, you use the XLIF uh, instrumentation. Yeah, correct, this. correct. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do a lot of x -lifts. I just think this is so much, in, this is a really great case for posterior. I mean, you just, you know, you just spend a lot of yeah. time. I use the Masonic scalpel now because uh, John's taught me how to use it. And uh, the ultrasonic scalpel makes it a lot less bloody, a less, lot less bloody. So you can do that. And this looks good. It looks fine. But I just think that the, it's just a lot easier to completely take out. <coughs> you do that. Um, this is an unusual, it's an unusual sort of like hemivertebrae in some way. Maybe it's untreated, but he looks good. He's balanced and. And he decided yeah, to stay he, away from S1 because of, uh, so he's, he didn't want to go to the pelvis. You know, yeah, I, I wanted, he's 16. He actually just plays soccer. So, you know, <laughs> I, I sort of, I, I think we actually restricted his motion after this, to be honest, but I did discuss with him the, the potential need to go to the pelvis in the future. And um, if you go to the next slide, you know, it was one of the ch most challenging thing was trying to build in a little bit of lordosis here. I mean, we did, um, and not as much as I would have liked. Um, I mean, he was kyphotic there. I think he's about neutral or a little bit, little lordotic right now and uh, somewhat balances his thoracic spine. I mean, we'll see how he does, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, an in, in interesting problem. It is an interesting problem. Yeah, cool. See, in many ways, the skinny cat, that's interesting. I, I do a lot of x -less, so it's interesting to use that instrumentation to take out the uh, hemivertebrae. It's really an easy approach, right? I mean, you just make a small incision yeah. and use those pointers. But uh, did you use a neuromonitoring from the front? Like you put the neuromonitor on the, uh, on the psoas muscle and make sure you're not on the nerve root? Yeah, we did. And um, so we, we, we did that all that, as, as if we were doing an x -less. And so we... Uh, and the nice thing about the hemivertebra is that it was right there because it was, um, you know, yeah, it was not incarcerated. It was not incarcerated. It was not, yeah. Cool. What, what's this study show, uh, John? So, uh, this is a uh, uh, like system making review, um, but this uh, was the adult school of his patients. Um, so they looked at um, longs, so more than three segment um, fused posteriorly, um, stopping at L5 or um, S1. Um, but they, from their study, they only found three retrospective core studies that met their inclusion criteria. And um, the limited data show that um, there's essentially no difference in the revision rates and the functional outcomes. It does not, however, show the uh, rate of adjacent segment disease. Um, the follow-ups for those three studies were about three to five years. So that's another limitation for this. And the revision rate, rate was all over the place, around um, 20 to 50% among the three studies that they um, surveyed. No. And uh, this is another paper uh, that I um, found. Um, so the question is whether to do these kind of operations in a stage manner or, uh, or um, just by single stage. Um, this is a recent paper. It's published in Spine Deformity um, this year. Um, they got, um, so they did a retrospective review, minimum two, two year follow up. So, the la so staging the lateral approach and posterior approach, um, I haven't found any literature for that. Um, this, they're looking at anterior posterior spinal fusions and um, they had 70 non idiopathic cases. Um, 14 were um, staged and 56 underwent um, single stage surgery. Um, well, the problem with this is it's just like a historical perspective only. So few of us are doing I mean, this is a different type of case, but so few of us are doing anterior spinal surgeries these days that are staged to posterior spinal. We used to do them all the time, and this is almost like a, like a, a historical interest only. I'm sure that even, I'm sure, you know, Dr. Uh, Casual doesn't do very many anterior posteriors now. This is just a different type of case. And so it's interesting that, you know, they found a difference, but yeah. almost none of us are doing discectomies to release the thoracic spine anymore. It's just not, it's just not done. I mean, I just... That's been a change over the last 10, 10 years as well, you know, with Larry's work and everything. Yeah, the only difference, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, the only difference they found was the uh, um, upper time and the length of stay, but otherwise they, um, all the outcomes were um, not, uh, not different significantly. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Feldman, are you tethering down there at? 
Yeah, so and, I've done a couple. Uh, I, I need a reason to do it. So I've done a couple only. I just okay. had to retake that course. Um, you know, I don't know the answer. I just, I just listened to those guys, you know, talk about it again. You know, the, the guys who do it a lot. I'm not convinced I understand it for a type one. You know, why are we not, why are we doing tethering for type one curves? I mean, it makes no sense to me to try to keep the motion from a thoracic spine. Who cares? You know, if you fuse someone from T5 to T2 to T12, what difference does it make? If, and why do they go through their chest? So the only ones I'm using it for are really the weird cases of like lumbar scoliosis where I've got something else wrong, the hips don't move, and I want to just maintain the lumbar motion. So I've done like two lumbars, got a couple more to do, like you know, in like weird patients, honestly. But I mean, I offer it to patients now. I mean, have you done an apifix yet? Are you on the apifix trial thing? <laughs> no, no. I just that's, another, the, that's another one that I'm having trouble understanding why it's not a Harrington rod. You know what I mean? So I mean, I'm on it. I've got the device. I'm approved to do it with our IRB. I, I can go ahead and use it. And I'm trying to find my indications for these cases. I have like a, I have a, I have an, I basically have a device without an indication right now. But I think that the, it's interesting to see, but I just don't understand why I'm going to do a tethering. Yeah, for a I just uh, I have a hard curve. time right now with the um, with the indications, especially in the New York, New Jersey area of people who come to me who said they were tethered at the age of 16, you know, um, or 17. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, a well done selective thoracic fusion to me is uh, like doing a total knee at this point, you know, so um, I, I, I don't I quite can't, understand. I, can't, I mean, if it was my kid, and they had a, the selective thoracic fusion is a great operation. You know, I don't have to go through their chest. I don't have to worry about revision rates. I, I think that how many revisions have you made from a type one curve? You know, I mean, almost none. So why are we, why are we, re why are we adopting this? I understand for lumbar curves, I hate fusing patients to L4, but even that I've looked at these, you know, the tetherings for the lumbar spines and it's not exactly the greatest thing. So I just did one where I double stay, I double screw them in, in the lumbar spine. I put two screws in it, did a double tether because I was worried about it. It looks good so far. I mean, she has no motion of her hips. She's got CFD general thermal deficiency, so I did it for a reason. So I still need a reason to do tetherings, but patients want them. So if you're talking, you're talking about, you know, a sort of like a, a base of patients who really want, they think this is what they want. We don't want to be fused, it's a bad word, but it's hard to jump on that bandwagon. I know a lot of people in the New York, New Jersey area are jumping on it. You guys are probably the biggest, the highest rate between the New York group and the New Jersey group from Princeton to New York to Sinai. You guys have the most tethers done anywhere in the world. So it's, I'm sure you're being pressured to do them. Well, when I do my APA fix, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Well, um, that's pretty much the concludes, uh, you know, the, the time we have this morning. Um, so does anybody have any other questions? Is someone driving me to the airport, Alice? We have a ride to the airport? Or, uh, if this was in front of you. Uber it. <laughs> yeah, Let's we go. Great. All right. Well, I want to appreciate it. Really, Alice, thank you for all you did. And thanks. And great seeing you, even if it's over Zoom. And thank you all for listening. And great cases, guys. I'm sure it takes some work to present those and look it up. And remember those when you're doing things in between. Joe, thank you. And uh, thank, thank why you. Aren't you. Why aren't you working, Joe? Why aren't you, why are you still at home over there? I don't know. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing that virtual uh, boards today. Oh, virtual uh, boards. What does that mean? EOS uh, oral boards went virtual this year. And uh, so we're uh, we're preparing. We have to get our, our suit and tie at home on on the Zoom. So it's going to be interesting. You know? Really, right? So you're questioning page. You're questioning students for the boards. Is that what you're doing right now? Yeah, the uh, the part Oral two for part two candidates. Yeah. Well, well, well. It's very interesting. Well, well any other? Yeah, thank you, Wally, for attending as well. Oh, it's Wally, a pleasure. pleasure to see you both and hear you both. So let me know, Wally, when we can get together. When this is over, we can... Uh, okay. We can, we'll have a drink. Yeah, more than one. Okay. All right, guys. Well, really, everybody, right. thank you. And everybody's any... You always yeah, email. Say hello to Drawer. Say hello to Drawer. Say hello to Drawer. I will. I'll say hello. All right, Alice. Thank you again, Joe. Thank you, guys. Really, everybody. Great job. And uh, it's really, very, really a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Everyone.